Okay, hello. Can uh, everybody hear us? This is uh, Dustin Berserker Bear with Michelle Gibson. We are going to be doing Star Forts today. I have some pictures for you. I'm going to introduce myself, introduce her, her channel. As a matter of fact, I should get that up and ready. But we're going to do some uh, video clips and um, history of Star Forts, Bastion Forts. Compare them against uh, fortresses, castles. Actually, compare them against the ones that I have here in Buffalo, the Niagara region, um, Fort George, Old Fort Niagara, and um, Old Fort Erie. And we are going to get you a nice presentation as much as we possibly can. Um, my channel is Berserker uh, Bushwhack and Tartaria. Her channel is uh, her name, Michelle Gibson. Uh, she has extensive research of the old world, the timeline, your Moorish Tartary work, the water towers ley lines, um, the realm or globe-wide, you know, sacred geometry, uh, flower of life and the, the planet circle alignments. Fascinating. I, I highly recommend going to her channel and checking that out if you're interested in that type of work. It's uh, She's extremely extensive with her research. I, I was introduced to her about two years ago and uh, fascinated with her work and eventually got in communication with her. And... Uh, I guess the rest is history. I just really appreciate and I'm humble to be uh, interviewing you, Michelle. Thank you very much. So uh, yeah, your tetrahedron work, your star tetrahedron that you did on the homework that you gave me, the video that you have, I'll put the um, videos that Michelle wanted me to watch in my description after the video is uh, loaded up and everything for the viewers. But uh, yeah, your, your tetrahedron that you found, that's fascinating as well. And um how you cite that you believe that that's the terminus of the planetary grid system, that the um, ancient advanced civilization based all their physical infrastructure off of, um, and your work at piercing the veil. And if you can you know, introduce yourself and where people can find you, maybe expound off of uh, your work at piercing the veil and all that. So thanks for being on my channel, Michelle, and you can introduce yourself and where people can find you. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Dustin. And I must say your work is very impressive. I really enjoy your presentations and you have a very detail oriented mind and I appreciate that as well because I do too. Um, and it's really in paying attention to the details that and pattern recognition that the true history and the truth of the world that we live in starts to come into focus. A little bit about myself, I was born in July of 1963 and was raised outside of Washington, D.C. in Montgomery County, Maryland, in the Gaithersburg, Rockville area. I was in the Army from 1982 to 1986, and I got money for college. And I did travel. That's when I started going to different places around the world. I was stationed in Augsburg, Germany for two years. And... When I was on my breaks, I would love to jump on a train and go see different places. So that was another part of my journey that led to where I am today with all of this research. Just by de being in different places and picking up what's there, you know, memories of things. And then when I got out of the Army, I went to college and I got a degree in social work and psychology. And I was a geriatric social worker most of my career. And that was between like 1989. And I stopped working as a social worker around 2003, I believe. And, and then I've done other things professionally since that time. So I, I didn't ever go back into social work. I think I was burned out on it by that time. And I've lived in a lot of different places. I, I've been fascinated by megalis most of my life. And I would watch, um, as soon as it came out on the internet, megalithomania conferences with a lot of different earth energy researchers and watch their stuff and be absolutely fascinated by things being the same all over the world. I think we talked before, Dustin, that we have the same. same. <laughs> sure have. Yep. <laughs> have the same influences. Graham Hancock, Robert Chuck, um, exactly. yep. Bavo. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I think the very first alternative history book I ever read was Robert Boval's Orion 
mystery. And I read Fingerprints of the Gods and, you know, just fascinated. It's like, who did that? How, how's that possible? But that was my education. And the other part of my education was learning about sacred geometry. And I lived in Fairbanks, Alaska from 94 to 99. And then I moved back there in 2006 and lived there from 2006 to 2012. And, you know, it's like my whole life has been this journey, I think, to uncovering this information because it's like everything I've ever experienced has something to do with it. And so I learned about sacred geometry around 2007 in a Flower of Life workshop. And uh, John Velo McElzadek was a teacher that brought this information back. And I followed his work closely for about six years during that time. And he made a video in 2010 called Birth of a New Humanity. And he talked about an actual physical grid that was constructed. And I'm, I'm thinking, okay, who could have done that? But that was the very first time that I had any concept of an earth grid and that it was actually if it was actually physical. And when I moved to Oklahoma City to help with my mom, when my brother moved her from Florida, I that was that period of time that I was there was when I really started to wake up to this ancient civilization and make my own discoveries and start doing my own research. And um, you have the graphic of the, the map with the star tetrahedron on it. I, I have the actual map in front of me, but you're going to see it better if it's on the screen. So that's the flower of life and all sacred geometric shapes are contained in that. And that's actually the creation pattern of the universe. Everything's based on the flower of life. And so the, the, the actual map is here. It's tattered. It's torn. But... This is really where my own journey started and my own original research. And since I had already known about sacred geometry and the research that I talked about with megalithomania and ley lines and things like that, I had it sitting, I'm pulling it back up just again real, real quick. Yeah, that kind of thing. All those patterns are contained within it, the platonic solids and it's important knowledge. The ancients knew all about this stuff. It's also connected with um, vortex-based mathematics. So I had this map sitting on my dining room table. And by this time, I was traveling with friends of mine to places. Once I started to figure out that there was a, a, a code of cover-up words that we're calling ancient infrastructure natural features. Words like bluff, cliff, canyon, mesa. And waterfalls is another one. I mean, there's just so many things. It's, it, this was an amazing civilization that goes back to ancient times. And what people think are natural were man-made. And that's how they've managed to cover it up. I live in Sedona and I'm surrounded by ancient infrastructure but people see red rocks and they're amazed at how amazing nature is. And, you know, they don't see the infrastructure that's actually there. And it's laid out in the sacred geometric patterns here. Um, there's a, a tree of life here. Um, there's a star tetrahedron. Um, there's a pentagram. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff and it's all connected. So you can find that in a book by Mark Amaru Pinkham called Sedona City of the Star People. And he he talks about the sacred geometry that's here. Um, and it's actually since I moved here that this has really taken off for me. So, uh, you know, I might be soaking in some of the energies that are here as well. Um, but to go back to the map, I I found the star tetrahedron by connecting the, the cities that I was, was seeing lining up in lines. And I found the first tetrahedron where the apex is in Edmonton. And then I, I thought, okay, well, I found that and maybe I can find another one. And so I found the bottom apex, which is in Merida, Mexico. And then I extended the lines out and I had to switch to a globe. And I guess I have to insert that my work is not driven by whether or not earth is flat or round. I'm, I'm falling 
following earth alignments and I've gotten a tremendous amount of information from my research just following alignments. Can I say something on that? Uh-huh. The pattern still works on the flat for sure. It still makes a, a flower pattern as a matter of fact. Hold on one second. And that's what I'm, I find as well, that it works either way. Um, the important thing is the sacred geometry and the ley lines. And in my research, um, even though my passion is the ancient civilization and bringing it back to awareness, I have found evidence that our perception of space and time was tampered with. And I do talk about that in, in different places. Um, showing where the globe came in and who invented it and when they when they did. And ancient maps are flat and they have ley lines on them, the older maps. And they took the ley lines off and they turned it into a globe. So even though that's still not what drives my work, it definitely gives me pause and I can say, yeah, I found evidence that all of that was tampered with. So anyway, once I found the star tetrahedron and I extended the lines out and I, I had to switch to a globe because I couldn't visualize where the lines were going on the other side. I needed the visual to continue plotting the alignments. And what that resulted in is about, um, 19 pages of spreadsheets with data points of cities and places in alignment. And all of my research is based on these alignments. And had I not done the work of tracking the alignments in a number of my blog posts, which I turn into videos, had I not done that research, I would not have gotten the rest of the picture. It was following the alignments that showed me not only the, the true and original history of the earth, but how, how it was taken down and how everything's been rewritten and revised to bring us to the world we live in today and where we are at this moment with all the Twilight Zone stuff happening. So my work on the alignments has led me to uncovering history and how all this was has taken place. And I did have a Moorish American friend when I lived in Oklahoma and he brought the piece about the Moors into my life because I didn't know about the Moors before then. And learning about the Moors and Moorish science, which is based on sacred geometry and how they've been removed from the historical record, collective awareness, um, but they were the actual builders of civilization. And within the Moorish civilization, there were different empires and Tartaria was one of them, Barbaria was one of them. Um, the Mughal Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Persian Empire, um, empires within empire. And so it, it's Mu, uh, more actually refers to Mu, which is better known as Lemuria. But that goes back into ancient times and their civilization was continuous, um, I think up until relatively recently. And then negative beings figured out a way to create a cataclysm and um, destroy the original civilization. I think that's where the mud flood comes in. And then um, the controllers, um, the 1%, um, the corporation, the founders, founding families of the corporation and the richest people in the world are the ones that are behind what took place. And I don't believe it was natural because I think had it been a, a natural event, we wouldn't be sitting here talking today. Everybody would have been you know, wiped out, but they were obviously prepared and ready and did a lot of work to create a new history and create the control mechanisms that we've been living under, which I believe they re, uh, reverse engineered the grid system from a positive life enhancing force into a control mechanism. And so that's... You know, that's, flip. Yeah, and they just reversed it all, and they've they've kept us under this system without telling us and feeding us a false history, and you know, educating us in it, and then reinforcing it with movies and music and television programming, um, so that we wouldn't would not see what's actually in the environment around us 
and know the true history. And I think the show that um, Bus Berserker Bear has put together for us today will clearly show that. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, Michelle. And I agree with you 100% that they, I think that's also a dual purpose, uh, the utility of them um, showing that truth in media, uh, whether it's music, movies, even ga even games. Um, I think it that's their, they believe it relieves them of their karmic um, duty because they are telling the truth in a certain way. Right, and right. it's whether or not you get it, right? Uh, there's a great scene in the movie that I haven't watched yet. It's called Under the Silver Lake, where the guy's playing the piano, and he's telling the uh, protagonist of the movie uh, there is truth in, in in media, and it's uh, something that if you don't if the message if you don't get it, then it's not meant for you. Um, and that's there's no right and wrong in that. You know, it's some people attribute right and wrong, and to that it just is. It's the it's the constant yin and yang of uh, the black and the white. It's always going to be there. You just got to find a way to navigate through it, as as we all are right now. So thank you very much. So let's get right into it. Uh, we're just I'm just going to ask questions that are related. You know, I, I gave you the the outline, and I'm, we're just going to go down through it. And I'm sure there'll be enough generated um, talk back and forth uh, just from these questions. So. Um, if you're ready to go, I got everything. I got my coffee, and I appreciate everybody being here, uh, Canada Dummy. And, yeah, please hit the, the like button, if you will. I appreciate it. So um, let's do some. Yeah, and as we talk about it, Michelle, I'll go through and pull up the related or whatever you want me to bring up. Okay. And also, I've got, I've got tabs up on mine. We've got some echo right now. Okay, that's better. So I've got tabs up as well. So I'll be screen, uh, sharing my screen as we go through the questions. Okay, cool. Let me know because I'll stop sharing. And uh, do you have, let me, do you want to share a screen right now and see if we can? Uh... Yes. Okay, so I'll stop sharing. Okay. And, and now you share. Can you share it? Yep, I'm going to share it now. And then I'm just going through the questions that you gave sequentially. Um, because this one relates to the very first one. Cool. I'm gonna... So go go ahead. No. So this, so this is the question of the differences between fortresses, citadels, castles, and palaces. Yeah, how come it's not sharing your screen, though, Michelle? Actually, you know what? Add to stream. Here we go. That's easy. This is easy. Okay, cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay. So what I found is when I was following the alignments, I kept finding star forts. I wasn't looking for them originally, and then I realized that they were – that it was – when I looked, I was always going to find them. And I found them under different names. So fortresses, citadels, castles, and palaces. Um, and we're going to be tying a lot of different information in. So um, I'll save my finding out about star forts for another question that you have for me. Well, yeah, you know what? As a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, Michelle, if you want to take the helm and share your screen while I ask you the questions and uh, things that I show related or when I need to bring up the um, examples of the videos I have, we'll do that. But, and then let me know when you want to bounce something off of me. So we'll go through and we'll, um, okay. or if, or if you want me to share mine, it's okay. Whatever you feel. Okay. Let me figure out what I did because I thought I was uh, screen sharing. We have the Martin Lika um, effect here for you guys, you know, Side thumbs for Martin. Okay, I'm going to share screen again. I'm sorry, I thought I had it in there. Don't worry about it. We're firing from the hip here. This is how we do it, <laughs> it's like in Tartaria. So you're good. Okay, okay. can you can you yeah. see it now? I could see it. Yep. And now I got okay. you. Okay. Okay. Like, great. All right. All right. Here, check it out. There you go. Okay. Well, let me let me start here. This this brings in Sylvie and New Earth. Right. So, what are the differences between <laughs> the um, fortress? So, the first question I, I had was, what are the differences between uh, fortresses, citadels, castles, palaces, uh, because in, in mainstream star forts are actually called uh, bastion forts. 
So uh, Michelle will detail her findings on that. Okay. So what I was finding as I followed the alignments and I wasn't originally looking for them were star forts and again, star forts are everywhere. And I found them being called citadels, like you said, fortresses, castles, and palaces. And when I did this consistent finding of star, star forts on planetary alignments, I went back and looked at circle alignments that I did. And, you know, starting in Merida, I found two in um, Campeche, which is close to Merida. Uh, and I want to make the point that I find star forts in pairs and in clusters. But I also found them called different names and they were still star forts and I'm just going to, and different shapes. And that's the point that I wanted to make um, when Dustin and I first started talking about this program. Um, and I saw his one on the pier near where he lives that he fished on the other day. Um, there are a lot more atypical star forts out there um, that aren't even called what we're talking about now. There are piers. I found the RC Harris treatment water treatment plant in Toronto, Toronto as being one of these so-called star forts. Um, and I can show you that example as we go through this. Um, that one kind of looks like a beak that's in the Bahamas. This one's in the Florida Keys. It's on Dry Tortugas National Park and it's called Fort Jefferson. Um, so it's further west of Key West, so you can only get there by ferry or boat. And one of the really interesting things about this is that it's the largest brick masonry structure in the United States, made with over 16 million bricks, and it's the third largest fort and said to have been built between 1845 and 1861. And I think this is one that um, Cameron has talked about on autodidactic as well. Uh, so yeah. there's these, these inconsistencies. Yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> And the stories that were told about them are just really absolutely ridiculous. So we'll talk more about that as we go through our presentation today. Um, you know, how they're explaining their existence just makes no sense. This is in Bermuda. And Bermuda actually has, used to have a bunch of star forts. There are some that are still in existence, like Fort Hamilton. Um, you know, where that looks like they just added the cannon here to these these bastions. And then you find, you know, the circular ones, you find pointy ones, um, all different kinds. You know, just add a cannon here and there. Um, and these are also in Bermuda. And at one time, this little island was full of them. So this is a 1624 map that's attributed to Captain John Smith, who's best known for... Jamestown, Virginia, and Pocahontas, and that whole story. Uh, I don't have it pulled up, but I found a structure in Edinburgh, Scotland, that looks like this, but it's a housing area now, residential area. Um, and then I found a connection between Fernando Naronja and Bermuda, and Fernando de Naronja is like Bermuda in that it's a small island that's loaded with star forts. And then I did research on the Channel Islands off the coast of France. Uh, they're a British crown dependency, but the Channel Islands are loaded with star forts. And, and that makes a point of a triangle here between Bermuda and Fernando de Naronja. So I think that had some kind of energy generation function. Um, this is a very old star fort in Hawaii on the island of Kauai here. And it's, the Russians are credited with that. But it looks really ancient. Shout uh, out to Philip. And then, let's see. You know, star forts in Mexico. You know, again, you get these different shapes going here. Again, they're in pairs. Beautiful one in Veracruz. 
These are all in Veracruz. Okay, let's see. It's said to have been built between 1770 and 1776 as a guard post and repository for treasure before its shipment to Spain. Um, I found Amsterdam Island in the South Indian Ocean and as, as a starting point for one of my alignments. Um, interesting things down there are the geomagnetics of the island. And then when I was following that, and this is another example, the Citadel Fort Adelaide in Port Louis, which is the capital of Mauritius, which is an island republic in the South Indian Ocean. And again, you know, called the Citadel, but when you look at it from the air, you're still seeing, you know, the points on top of a high hill. I mean, these people were building <laughs> in very, very hard to get to places. So they were very comfortable with what they were doing with this guy up here. Um, this is in Somalia, in Mogadishu, and you find this citadel of Gondershe. Um, and then this is a circuit-looking fortress in northern Somalia. Circuit. Shout out, to, shout out to Jerry, the circuit board. And then this little, <laughs> this little fortress. <laughs> called an architectural masterpiece built on a, the foot of a rock to protect the city from Bedouin attacks. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't look like a defensive structure to me. You know, what a strange place to build it, right? Um, another thing is in uh, the Yemen, known as the Malram Bilkis, or the Sanctuary of the Queen of Sheba. And one of the interesting things that you find there is this old South Arabian in inscription, which looks like runes. And so I put the Norse runes there for comparison. Um, and I, I have Hebner as an example in, in something else that I wanted to show you, but uh, this is called the Hebner runestone in Oklahoma. And it's a massive rock that's encased in this wooden shelter. So and the story is that the Vikings were wandering through the area and carved these runes. Um, and they play it up at the visitor center. Um, and that reminds me a lot of the Gosford glyphs in Australia because you've got runes there. And in both of these places, it's sitting in ancient infrastructure. And I've got a, an example of that in something else that I'm going to show you. Um, so that's another way they deflect from people seeing what's really there. They just focus people's attention on one thing. Um, and I think it's real. I think the symbols are real. And that was the original language that the ancients used and part of their mastery of how to harness natural energy to create amazing things. Okay, so I'm just I'm just going through the differences. This is the Al Fahidi Fort in Dubai. It's a museum now, but it has some circuitry looking features here. And this is a, a really long piece, but I'll just go through a few more examples. On the island of Hormuz in the Strait of Hormuz, in the it's part of southern Iran, we find what's called the Old Portuguese Fort. And it was said to have been built after the Portuguese captured the island in 1507. And I found this map of Hormuz and a lot of stuff going on here. And so you've got the Old Portuguese Fort so-called Portuguese fort here. And then on the other side, you have a, what appears to be another star fort. And then now you don't see that other star fort, but you do see um, like up in this part here of the picture, you see something that looks like circuitry chips. Yep. And it's inter interesting that they're on uh, each side of uh, a body of water. It's uh, what we have here in Buffalo and mm -hmm. uh, Lewiston and Fort Erie or uh, Fort Niagara. Yep. Yeah. You know, we can talk about it more as we go through this, but I, I definitely think they were serving as batteries. Um, actual yeah, batteries. Talk about that. Yep. You know mm -hmm. what I want to do, actually? I'm going to share my screen. Okay. And I'm going to show the uh, different uh, facets of Bastion Forts, what they're saying, and may, uh, per the mainstream, of course. So you see that? So I think some some of what we're seeing are, uh, you know, what you pointed out um, could just be something like a, so you see a CD is a ra ravelin. There's actually a distinction for 
that being a fort. So it could be smaller pieces of bigger things. So what they're saying here, a facet of a larger star, D, as a reveline, um, could be this big. Something like this. So we could just be seeing smaller parts of the bigger thing that were, you know, like you said, dismantled and taken down. Or like New Earth said, some portions of them aren't even, like they're. Conf it's confusing if you say it's to um, defend against an attack because some sides of them, some are open. The flanks are open. Some have our body of water. It just doesn't make sense. That was a great point that she was saying. And the videos that I'm referencing for my, our viewers, again, I'll put in our description. But yeah, so I, and I want to show actually as well the, um, we're going to do the actual mainstream definition clip here, Michelle, the one that I, I sent you as, as a, um, <laughs> just so people see what we're saying here. Um, this is a mainstream video that, explains the definition of what they say a bastion fort is so here we go you might need to share your screen again and and put the sound click the sound button oh yep you're right good call so let's do this i'm glad you uh trained me on that okay <laughs> i just found out <laughs> how perfect within the last that, two right? weeks <laughs> Uh, I'm perfect. So clutch. Okay. So share audio. This one share. Thank you, Michelle. You're the best. I learned so much from you. Medieval fortresses were usually built high or on hills to make it possible to rain down arrows on approaching enemies. But these straight and tall walls, curtain walls, proved vulnerable to cannon fire. After the invention of gunpowder in the 9th century in China, the first depictions of cannons appeared there in the 12th century. Spreading west across the Eurasian continent, they were widespread in Europe and the Middle East by the end of the 14th century. The fall of Constantinople in 1453 was a wake-up call. Its massive walls were seen as impenetrable. But Sultan Mehmed II used his powerful cannons to breach even these walls, proving medieval design was no longer effective. The epitome of classic European cannon design was reached around 1480, with the design not changing much all the way until the 17th. Possible hydraulic water monitors, in my, in my opinion. Possibly. Cannonballs, eh. 50. And it's in this time we also see defensive architecture change as a response to this formidable foe. Gone were the tall towers and straight walls of medieval forts, and in came the Bastion Fort, or Star Fort. Although not a new invention, these fortresses had low, sloped earthen banks called glasses. These were sloped on the outside towards any possible attacker, and made it difficult for cannon fire to seriously damage the citadel behind them. By creating these jutting bastions, the flanks or curtains of a fortress could be overseen, eliminating dead zones. Okay, then it goes in to talk about the moats and everything, and we're, we're talking about dead zones, we're talking about fire. Now, what there's what, what mainstream is, is saying here is that those beautiful designs, those intricate designs that are not only ma masonry construction, but earthworks as well, because the actual land is shaped to the star as well is only done specifically for what you just seen and what we're proposing is that that seems hokey allegedly could it be and we're just uh proposing questions and uh it's kind of the work that we do that's the crux of the issue here that's what they say bastion forts are and um that's what we're doing here presenting anomalies in the mainstream so um what do you think about that, Michelle? Totally. And I think between the two of us, we're going to give some really great examples of the ridiculousness of what we're told in the historical narrative. How dare you. And, and not only that, I mean, it, it certainly seems from the research I'm doing that um, wars and armed conflicts were really focused on destroying a lot of these beautiful structures. Absolutely. Now, here's a good example. Because look, what I always say is you see the star pattern here, right? 
if you zoom in, it's industry. And what that just speaks to me, a logical thought progression is they're like covering up, hiding it, dismantling it, quarrying it. Um, and because look now, I mean, you can hardly tell. Well, there's actually a good. In this one, you can hardly even see what they tried. And this is why I think that there, this might have been a canal back in the day, but you lose the shape of it. You can literally see the progression of industry encroachment on these things. And I think Buffalo is a really good example of that because we know for sure you have them. Here's the thing. We, you know for sure you have them on, on different points. And there's a um, matter of fact, um, on the heads of rivers and the, and the, uh, the foot of them, like you just detailed, you had that in Buffalo, mm -hmm. but they hid, they hid the one in, in South Buffalo. And let me just pull that yeah. up and, and show you an example. I should have had this pulled up already. Yeah, it's pretty crazy what they've done here. So, yeah, um, that's what they say. The mainstream says that the Bastion Forts are for. There obviously is one hidden that I was fishing on in Buffalo. And um, now uh, I'm going to go, we'll go into the next question, but I just want to illustrate real quick on this platform how things are hidden. Shouldn't be lagging too much like that. Okay, so here's Buffalo. I'm glad I was right here. Can you see that? There's Fort Erie, and we got a for sure star fort right there, okay? Right across the way is where it should be in Buffalo, where I was fishing. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what the, it used to look like. These are Library of Congress maps. You see the Star Fort here, and then it's lost here. They do that purposely, for sure. Also, I could, I can double down on that with when they present stuff like this in uh, books that I look up that uh, on the internet. This is an 1812 uh, Niagara Frontier during the War of 1812. You can't find this picture too too easily on the internet. This this X right here demarcates that Fort Erie star. So I can that's why I say guarantee this was a star here because it's even labeled on this eighteen. And again, the War of eighteen twelve. I had the clip of that. The whole you the guy says you won't find a, a cornerstone before eighteen thirteen. Um, and you got it. You got a star marker here in Buffalo, and other pictures of this, Michelle. That's that X is gone. So they they do try to fudge it out. Yeah. So that's that's my argument, and I'm sticking to it. They definitely pave paradise. Yes, they did, and they're been, they, they profit from it because this is we're talking about energy. <laughs> so the modern energy industry is based on this ancient technology. I have no doubt about that. I agree. So let's go on to the next one. Um, referring back to New Earth and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of work that she does. Also, you know, um, I have to mention my good friend, another researcher is, is Philip. It has a lot of old Philip Druzinen has a lot of uh, videos about Star Forts too. And mm -hmm. I was going to mention him also. Uh, but uh, what's New Earth's name? I forget her name. Sylvie. I think it's Sylvie Ivanova. Sylvie. Yeah. The most um, like pleasing voice on the, on the, in the entire internet. Plus her, um, her channel is fascinating. Okay, so let's get into the next one. Do you agree? I mean, she's been doing this work for a long time, and she was yeah. definitely part of my journey. So I'm really glad that you had that as a question, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, Michelle, you know what? Let me end mine. Um, yeah, you said you watched that video of hers in 2015. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, I did a... Oh. One of the very first blogs that I did was about star forts and I learned so much more than I did when I did that. Can you see my screen? I sure can. Let me add it. Now I got married in 2015, Michelle. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, I was doing it in 2015. You were, <laughs> woke, you were woke to this. To this I, was, I was waking up to this. It was before I found the star tetrahedron in North America uh, in 2015, but it was part of my journey to waking up to all of that. And 
I was starting to figure things out and Sophie, I mean, Sylvie was one of the few channels at the time that was doing this kind of work. And so I watched a number of her videos then. And so that was in 2015 and 2016 was the year this started taking off for me. And when I found the star tetrahedron um, and, and star forts are really a gateway topic to this subject because a lot more people know about star, star forts and ask questions. Yeah, they're so visually engaging and beautiful, mm -hmm. right? To the eye. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I think this is the actual one that you showed that graphic of, the Fort Fortange in the Netherlands. Okay. You know, beautiful one, lacy one. Uh, this one's in Portugal. And Hakodate in Hokkaido, Japan. All over. Um, and I found this also following an alignment. Um, when I was tracking it, I went right across this place in Hokkaido. Uh, Paul Manova, the one that you showed already, um, which looks to me a lot like CERN. Definitely. I think at a certain level, these guys model it after that and try to make it look it look like that, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's real technology behind all of this. Um, and I linked her video in this particular blog post. Um, and then this is a, a much shorter one done by somebody else. And so that was in around, I think, November or December of 2015. And it was my very first introduction to the subject, like I said. But what happened within like just a couple of months, somebody mentions um, Statue of Liberty being on a star fort and that's Fort Wood. It's 11 points. Put their stamp on it. Mm -hmm. So within like a couple of months, I was at Hebner Runestone State Park that I just mentioned a little bit ago. And I saw this, you know, that same pattern here You know, you get worked stone here, and I'm going to get show you another example. This is at Hebner Runestone State Park. It reminds me of my homework assignment that you gave me. <laughs> and this is on the outskirts of the park. This isn't even where the runestone is. I mean, there's no attention drawn to the part of the park that's not where the runestone is. And, and you see these beautiful walls. And I took more pictures when I was there that I didn't include in here. You know, there's an interesting point I want to make here that I talked with, I'm not sure, my buddy, um, Campbell, knows familiar, uh, Mr. Brees. He's a good researcher, too, uh, my homie. I talk with him a lot. And we throw ideas back and forth. He's probably sleeping right now. I think it's the other side. He's, on, <laughs> okay, he's in uh, Queensland. Um, so, Cam, thanks for staying with us, homie. But, um, yeah, he was – put the notion out there or told me, like, he when they designate a, an area as a state park – that means that it's like the cleaner's been through it. We're good, mm -hmm. good, to, good for the public to go in and not deduce as much. And you know, a lot of dot walk through the trails and not be like, oh, that's possibly a castle, you know, an old citadel. You know, that's like a. It's also a sign, a communication that you know this house is clear type of deal. And it's, it's right. and along with that, it's also where you can find the ancient civilization preserved, and that was part of my journey in uncovering this when I started looking, looking at, for it. Definitely, definitely. When I started looking at national state and local parks, because if they're not preserved, they tend to be destroyed by construction and, and things like that. Um, new roads and new housing developments and things. Um, so anyway, like within months of learning about star forts, I saw that at um, Hebner Runestone State Park, those um, pointed shapes, and then I was watching this video. It's a music video called Climbing in Geometry. That was fascinating, that picture. And I, and I noticed that. I don't know what the heck that is, but somebody pointed it out. <laughs> I didn't notice it at first. Oh, no, it looks like it just uh, added in. <laughs> but that's the real formation of an outcropping that looks similar yeah. to what a star fort would be. Yeah. 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 That, that's So I, I noticed that. And then I Googled Climbing in Geometry. And this was really when I started to get it. It was a very intuitive synchronistic uh, um, process for me. And I grew up near Carter Rock in Maryland. I, I didn't ever think anything of it, but I found this description in, um, in this blog post called Roped Up Climbing at Carter Rock. And he talked about 
um, the this climber was going up it and he described thoughtful moves on polished slabs. And this is called Jungle Cliff there. And Carter Rock is also the home of the Naval Sea Systems Command. And I, I don't remember if you and I were talking about this just a little while ago, or I think I was talking about it with somebody last night. Um, they build military installations on top of power nodes. Um, Camp David, the presiden presidential retreat in Western Maryland is, is also built on a powerful place. Most famous, I'm sure, you know, people know Area 50, Area 15, we'll say, we'll try to escape the bots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And you, you, you're near the, you're in the area that you are, is um, known for being a hot spot as well, right, mm -hmm. Michelle? Yeah. yeah, it is. And, you know, like I yeah. said, I, I think I probably benefited from living living here. <laughs> I believe, um, I think the same, honest to goodness, I think the same thing with the water, with the, with the, the, the flowing water of Niagara river. And I think that some of it is still going under underground. Uh, we could talk about that. Like that on the outline, the ghostbusters, the inversion of ghostbusters too. <laughs> Truth in media. We've already, we, we've addressed that already, which is great. Yeah. So I just stopped sharing my screen. Okay, perfect. So, uh, yeah. So do you agree? Uh, when um, Sylvie says that um, they appear to be uh, strategic, uh, built strategic and points she points out extremely well that um, some of the sides aren't completely uh, sealed off and that they're open and some of the arrows are what you would call the is um, the definition would be the ravine ravelines ravelins are pointing inwards um, what do you think that speaks to it because it doesn't make sense as far as an, if, if an invading ar army is coming uh, or like it just said in, in those um, cannons, I you know I know it's a it's a a big one. What do you think? I think the ancients knew exactly what they were doing, and everything has a reason and a purpose within the planetary free energy generating grid system. Isn't I think everything was precisely placed. Um, from ancient to relatively modern, because we're still using their infrastructure every day. Schools, churches, cathedrals, uh, bridges, museums, you name it. We're still using their infrastructure. So let I me, think. Let me show you something, Michelle. Uh, this comes from the uh, fellow. Uh, researcher here that I have on IG. I'm going to share my screen and see what you think about this. Okay. This is an experiment that he does. I call Mr. Wizard. It's moon jazz bear. Another fellow, you know, fan of um, Owen Benjamin uh, comedian, but uh, you know, a lot of us like to research uh, a lot of uh, this stuff and look at the, this um, experiment that he did regarding radials and radio patterns. Mm -hmm. I came across that recently. Okay, cool. So you get a little, little synchronicity. Mm -hmm. Why is this not playing? The civilization that was here before bears no resemblance to what we're taught in our history. So this is interesting. Here. Different. What he's doing, okay. Can you see that? He's taking a laser and pointing it through a prism that's on the ground. And see where, where where the points are meeting. It's actually creating an actual. It's actually creating a radio pattern that's that, that's um, emanating out. Circle. There you go. Let's see if I could stop it on it. Boom. See. Okay. See where at this nexus point, it's a radio pattern, and I wonder. You know what they say, the Lechtenberg event and anything, if, or the, if the sun, the luminary does act as a lens, that them radio patterns may have been seared. You know, we think that these huge electrical events it may have happened. Cam and I have discussed that before. You, you're, you're aware of them. Um, look at, 
that's li literally demonstrating that if you if you point a laser through a what's acting as a prism or the lens, it could be the sun. Uh, that's possible, and um, that's just another possibility of what could have. You know, I, I think they may. It, I'm not saying it did happen. It's a possibility that. That's one way that radio patterns were established because I think the whole um, narrative of the Ellicott brothers making the radio patterns in like you know two days is <laughs> ridiculous. Did you what, have a place in mind to show that clip about the frequencies effect on the water? Let's do it or right this now. Good, this is a good place. Very good place. So how they're made. Great. Thank you for bringing this up. So this is a video that you guys can look up, and it's called "Amazing Water Sound Experiment." And, Michelle and I were, you know, hypothesizing how these things are made, and we're just going to show this to you. Now, this is uh, this was shared to me by another fellow researcher on our Miwi channel, Andrew Booth, who's in Mississauga, another mud flooded, old old world um, city. And I'd like to get him on um, a video like this because he does kind of boots on the ground as well. Again, Andrew Booth, I'm not sure if he's here, but uh, he sent me this, and he was just postulating, could this be? Um, a way in which star forts were made. Well, let's take a look at it. Of course. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, of course. Right? Darn, darn YouTube in their ads. <laughs> you guys can see my music playlist. I don't even monetize my YouTube channel. I still get them. Yeah, I take it off. I, I, literally, I, I I keep a couple of them on. I play with them, you know. I don't, I don't need it. Okay, so what they're doing? Here you go. See that? Okay. Boom, star, you know, or right angles. That's crazy. It's falling water. And I know when you asked me about it, I, you know, I definitely think they were utilizing frequency in whatever way they, they did this. I mean, cymatic patterns are really clear in this infrastructure. This is a good one. Look at that. Sound, you know, walls of Jericho sound, the, um, the, the horn of Helm Hammerhen in Lord of the Rings. Um, they marched around the city of Jericho and the walls came down when they blew, blew the horns. Has to be addressed. Um, very, very, very interesting. Yeah, look at that. There you go. Just something to ponder, something to uh, keep on the table. Excellent share, Andrew Booth, my man. So there you go. Yeah, who, you know, I'm not sure how that would happen, but if if you're if you take into account the possibility of the Lechtenberg event, um, you can't take that kind of stuff off of the table, right? So let's move right along here. Um, regarding star forts and water and the power generators, perfect segue. Um, do you believe that they were ancient power generators? Keeping in mind that New Earth uh, says that water is a key component. And extracting the gas but that's one thing that we think that these things are is gas mm -hmm. that they were extracting gas in the, the videos that you um, cited yep. from new earth um and what are your best theories as to the application of you know these alleged harnessed energies you know how what was the mechanism of delivery you know to what end what terminal what how was it you i mean literally what do we use it for you know what was the utility of it I know it's free okay. energy. How was, uh, how was it transferred? I do have answers to your questions, but my, that's, <laughs> that's a big subject. I'm just rattling off. <laughs> like, but I could definitely put forth what I think was going on. And um, 
um, that question also talks about Malta, which is what I had pulled up to go into. But definitely, go ahead. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna go into something else as well because of what you said. But I guess I'll start with Malta. But what you mentioned about the gas, and I have to say, I see gas wells all over these ancient sites, especially when I was doing my own field re research. Um, I would see a megalithic wall in Oklahoma and there would be a horse head well sitting right there. And I, I think the same thing's true with the star forts. They're definitely harvesting that energy. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Perfect. And, and I don't have to worry about audio because it's my blog post. Oh yeah. Make sure you check that audio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, there you go. So I just wanted to share a little bit about Malta because Malta is like a Disney world of sea forts and stone masonry. It's just absolutely mind blowing what's yeah, there. So New Earth has a great um, <laughs> thing about that. It's amazing. It's like, oh my God, how did they do that? Unbelievable. And so I didn't have any problems finding star forts when I was looking around Valletta, which is the capital city of of Malta, which is an island republic that's between Sicily and and um, the country of, come on, Tunis. Sicily, uh, Italy. So, so, okay, so it's, it's really? between the the the, uh, the island that the boot of Italy is kicking, and the the country of Tunis in North okay. Africa. Okay. And Tunis is the site of the historical Carthage. Oh, Tunisia. Yeah, Carthage. Yeah, yeah. Tunis right. is the capital city of Tunisia. So it sits yeah. between those two countries. Very familiar. Which, and it's not far from Egypt, you know. And this, right, so it's the northern part of Africa, right across from right. The, the southern boot of Italy. Yep. Yeah, and all the same uh, architecture and infrastructure, it's all throughout there. So it's all throughout everywhere. Um, so I'm finding these star forts all over the place. Um, and during the days of the British Empire, the they would just went right in there and sucked everything up and claimed it as their own. But um, the all kinds of star forts there. And I'm just gonna kind of go through a lot I'll of the stuff. You know, I'm gonna I, I'll be right back. Can you just go through this and I'll sure give me a presentation? Give me yep. thirty seconds. Okay. Um, you know, so cathedral looking buildings there. Um theaters, this the same street corner style of architecture is all over the world. Uh, I go into my thoughts about why they called theaters Orpheums and Orpheus was a musician and poet said to have the ability to charm all living things, even stones with his music. And I think it's a reference to putting us to sleep with movies and things like that. Um, and this is the same style of architecture I was just talking about. Um, this one is in, this is Malta, this is Mexico, Merida, Mexico, this is Juarez, Mexico. This is in the Ukraine, this is Prince Edward Island, and this is in the country of Guinea in Africa. Um, and one of the points that I wanna make, there's a couple, um, when you see these in these, in these protected harbors, um, typically you'll find these man-made jetties and there's a, a lighthouse on either side. And I think I have an example of that with this one. Lighthouses are part of this system as well. You know, so you've got this beautiful old masonry with the lighthouses. Um, again, multiple examples. You see that at the port of Dover in England, same idea. But another thing I wanted to point out with these star forts is they were bombed during World War II. So Fort St. Elmo here, which stands, um, there's like three star forts in a row here. And on the first day that Malt became involved in World War II, they started bombing these places. Of course. <laughs> and that story is over and over again. Um, I'm just, I'm just going to scroll through here real quick because there's just a ton of information and we'd be here all day if I went through everything and I just want to try to highlight some things. 
I realize I meander through my my work here, but um, it brings up stuff a lot of times that's important to bring out and how the original civilization was actually put together and then what happened to change the, the narrative, which is what we're taught in school. Michelle, you can go right ahead and uh, do your thing with that because I like to underline that, that you're extremely good with that. And that's one of um, the things that I look to you and look up to you for because you really do get into the literature and compare and contrast against the mainstream timeline and history as to what we see and try to put it all together. So I, I think that that's, yeah, obviously you can hammer on that for sure, because that's your fast, your, your work on that is amazing. And I went there you know, when I first started doing this work, I, w I was just following the alignments. And when I did that, all this other stuff came out. And that's how I started getting into the history because of the, you know, again, I can't say it enough because of the absolutely ridiculous stories they tell us about how things got there because they're trying to hide the existence of this civilization. And if you even look at it at all, it falls apart. And as we go through this presentation, we're just going to give you more examples of that because it's an asinine. <laughs> Um, yeah. So you see the, the cotton arrow lines here in Valletta, and you see the bastions, you know, um, Star City. And we're told that it was built in the 17th and 18th centuries to form the outer defenses of these, I guess, what's the three cities of Valletta. There's these little communities around the main part. Um and then you get, you know, a mud flood looking effect here as well. And it's massive infrastructure on the inside. You said to have been built in the 1530s. I mean, how they have the technology according to the history that we're taught. And oh, by the way, this is the um, Inquisitor's Palace in Malta. Um, so the Inquisition comes in and then they just start torturing people. <laughs> you know, how did we get to this place we are today at such a low level of consciousness? collectively, you know, th these kinds of things have been happening to humanity um, with the controller's plans to take everybody, you know, everything over and, you know, bringing in torture and all that kind of stuff. But today the Inquisition is called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. So you wouldn't know <laughs> that the Inquisition still exists today. You know, they, they want to bring in this dogmatic thinking. And, you know, you have to believe a certain way in order to get saved or, you know, be a good Catholic or, or whatever the case may be. Um, so I'm just going to scroll down because, like I said, there's just, you know, a ton of star forts here in Valletta. And this is the only place in Malta I have really studied. I'm sure if I did a, a deep dive on Malta, on a Malta, I would be, have my work cut out for me. Um, so it's interesting I would, did an interview the other day, and I didn't think to mention this, but the whole subject of mer people came up, mer mermaids and mermen, and were they real? And you've got these statues all over the place showing half men, half fish. Um, so I'm just going to throw that out there because it yeah, came Martin, up earlier Martin this week. The Phoenician, the Phoenician um coming from the water. That's what Martin Liedke would say. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Martin, flat out British. So they are in statues in different places. This is in, um, in Sicily and Catania in Sicily. And there was the one that I showed you in Valletta, which is at the first one. Cause that's, that's why I started going down the, the uh, Triton rabbit trail in this. Um, So the main city gate of Valletta from 1871 is when it was supposed to have been built. Most of the city gates have been changed or destroyed in Valletta. This is what remains of the opera house, which was bombed during World War II. Okay, so that's what's left. They've turned it into an open-air theater. It was set that was said to have been built in 1866. You know, more mud flood looking 
appearance. And then it was bombed during World War II. Of course. And, you know, that story's repeated over and over again. Um, but this is kind of what I wanted to show you. I mean, this is rock cut. <laughs> like, yeah, the Malta, <laughs> the Malta anomalies with the Star Ford is, so you know what comes to mind is, in, I have it in the questions, but I might as well address it now is what, well, it's in this one actually, in the Malta episode. Oh, yeah, you're, you're already ahead of me. Because Brian Forster, you know, we come from the megalithic intrigue and Brian Forster, his work is, um, you know, I guess second to none in that in that um, department. Yeah. Um, well, go ahead. I was just saying, check out Paul Cook's channel also. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, he's, he's yeah great, that. great work on that, on everything. He's doing great oh, work. Oh, dude. And he's uh, he lived there. He lived in Malta. Malta, right. He did. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, so if you get him on one of these with Cam and everything. Uh, we, yeah. He's he's one that you really want to look really closely at this this city, Bolt Valletta. Um, I recommend his videos highly. I remember yeah, he's, he's actually there about Malta where he goes on the street views is really cool. Yeah. And then so to extrapolate off of that and kind of combine disciplines here, if you will, with the megalithic and I guess the alternate alternate uh, history that we research, um, Brian Forrester, I pull from him. For example, when you see something like Malta, because he'll say with the stuff that he sees in Peru, that different styles of construction indicate different civilizations, you know, and I see that here in Buffalo. Um, granted, you know, the War of 1813 allegedly burned everything down. There's still merit to that, to, to hold that to what we see for at Malta, what you're going through. He specifically says different styles of construction indicate different cultures or civilizations. I, I want I want to go back to what I was just showing you from Google Earth, but that's why I went down that way a little bit. So to give you some perspective, this is that elevator. And I, I pulled this out because if you just look at the depth of the stonework here. I mean, how in the heck did they do that? And when did they do that? I mean, it was this really ancient looking place and ancient stonework. And so this is another view of where the the Baraka lift is. Look at that. And, and it just gives you an idea of the depth yeah. of this wow. place. And that's just one piece. And this was said to have been constructed in 1905, closed in 1973, dismantled in 1983 and that a new lift was inaugurated in 2012. You know, so what's that, you know, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, why do that if it's working perfectly well? No. And, and again, that's, you know, they, they say they, a lot of these ma massive stonemasonry structures were in poor condition. So they had to tear it down and, and build a, a new building of infinitely inferior quality. That, and then that's, you know? <laughs> that's where, that's where they, they, they obfuscate the hit. That's where the rubber meets the road where mm -hmm. they obfuscate the history and, and where the literature gets all jarbled because they can't, you know, the truth is baked into the crust here, you know, as far as I'm concerned, and they can't fully do it completely where you can't see through it. Right. We, we pick those holes mm -hmm. out all day long with the research that, you know, we do uh, Campbell autodidactic, Paul yourself, um, everybody who's in the community, you know, it's all, that's why I kind of like to have everyone together and on the same page. We can certainly disagree, but this kind of stuff is, there's merit to all getting different opinions and, you know, what we're doing now. And you know what, actually, who uh, made a great point? There you go, Canada Dummy. Thank you. So uh, let's move right on to the next question. So, so, no, you, you, asked, you asked me, a, you, you asked me a multi-level question. <laughs> <laughs> the well, last time and i just i just uh started in malta but you know what do i think is going on here i, I think it's very sophisticated circuitry energy right how was it it's, it's, energy. it's energy the electromagnetic grid system it was how it was set up and um you know there's so many directions i can go off on this but um i'm going to start here because this is where i kind of made a discovery from doing the research. And these are based on comments that I had received from people on places to look. And uh, this is where I started with this last series. 
um, because somebody suggested looking into Shepherd's Bush, which is in West London, um, which is part of the White City District is part of it. Um, and Wormholt is there. And I've done an interview with him about Wormholt because that's a fascinating place as well. But there were um, these exhibitions, uh, this, the White City, uh, 1908 Franco-British exhibition. And, you know, again, it's another example of the original infrastructure being used for world's fairs. Uh, and they, they had like six of them in a short period of time, one right after the other. And we're also told that this stadium was built for the uh, Olympic games in 1908. 08, which was held at the same time. Uh, so the stadium came up, uh, you know, World Fairs, no longer there. I wanted to show you the flip flap that was at the exhibition. Look at that. And the Moorish architecture that's here. But to me, that, that was probably had some kind of generative function on the right. grid. So the the ancient the ancient civilization that actually built these parks were using it somehow to um, enhance energy and I'm sure have people have a good time at the same time. Yeah. There's something going on here because trolley parks are connected with this, and these amusement parks were always at the end of trolley lines. They were one terminus of these trolley lines, and a lot of times star ports were a terminus. Michelle, let me say something here. Because this is uh, kind of parallel to what we're doing with, when I was speaking with Philip about the mining, because that looks that looks like one of those conveyor things that you can easily just send the stuff up and pour stuff over and cover stuff up with mining ex extra, and which is one uh, thing that I think might be what we're seeing is like them actually literally covering stuff over that would be spoil tips or whatever or the the mining. Uh, uh, tailings, right? Uh, because we're speaking about gas mining. M mining was known in ancient history. You know, we're said that the Chinese were the first to do it and run gas for the mainstream. They knew about it. And especially with um, Philip has videos of it too, New Earth. They were possibly pulling gas from these things. Um, and if there is... If, if the narrative is to try to cover the, you know, the robber barons, the industrial revolution may have been just them covering all this stuff up. And as someone who would be, it doesn't make dollars. It doesn't make sense as a robber baron would think. Um, kind of in the light of how Philip was saying, mining kind of makes, you know, practical sense too. you know, move it over and you can just wash it all down and literally use the excess to cover stuff up. I propose, and I think that some of it might be them covering up, and those trusses that you just showed could be dual purpose and used for that also, just to cover things up because mm -hmm. it's actually used in mining now. Those things, it's interesting. Yeah, and I, I think there was a just a completely integrated system. Whatever was going on with these these parks, um, because they're they're surfacing all over the place. Um, They've all been destroyed, you know, these original locations of exhibitions and so forth. Maybe a few buildings standing here and there, but for the most part, they've been destroyed. And the trolley parks, um, the trolleys are gone. Uh, so I think all the rail lines, um, railroads and subways and electric streetcars, I think that was all part of this system, this free energy system. Yeah, and they might and it was all over the earth. So um, let me just go on down here real quick because uh, this part's about those world fairs. Um, I'm doing the research for it. I'm making connections back to previous research. Uh, let's see. And I do think the purpose of these exhibitions and expositions is to tell us the story that they want us to, to know. Um, Agree. One is a device. One, there are two definitions of the word exposition. One is a device used to give background information to the audience about the setting and characters of the story, and the other definition is that it's used in television programs, movies, literature, plays, and music. So, what better way to tell your audience the story you want them to believe than the 
you know, definition of an ex exhibition or trade show. You know, so they're, they're setting the stage for us. This is what they want us to know about history. Uh, so here was the track for the White City Stadium that we're told. Uh, we talked about the Olympic Games that were held there. And then it became host to the English Greyhound Derby between 1927. It was closed in 1984 and it became BBC White City today because the stadium itself was demolished in 1985. I like how they always put like activities and games over these things, mm -hmm. you know, uh, baseball stuff or, you know, parks, golf courses. It seems like it's a mock you're playing over the old world. It's part of that, but I think there's a, an energy function going on here. You know, I think they're harvesting Definitely. energy. It's dual purpose. And it's performance enhancing, but they're also making a heck of a lot of money with the people that are there betting on dogs and horses and cars. Um, and there's gambling in a lot of these places. So they're just making a ton of money with, with this. Um, so Shepherd's Bush tra tram terminus, tra trains are gone. These electric streetcars replaced by buses in 36. Um, and this story is repeated all over the world. It went from this, you know, low cost, low polluting form of transportation that was all over the world and replaced them with buses. <laughs> And so uh, part of their scam. So when I was looking at all the stuff in Shepherd's Bush, I was reminded of Sulphur Springs in Tampa, which I visited last summer and did a whole study of. It was the last field re research that I did because I was drawn by the water tower that was there. And then I looked around the whole area. And I noticed that Heathrow Airport is in this kind of relationship to Shepherd's Bush to where the White City would have been. And this is Sulphur Springs in Florida. And there's a racetrack there as well, which I knew because I visited there. So I remembered the racetrack. Okay, so I saw this angular relationship here. It's pretty close. Um, you get the Oxbows, which is another feature. Uh, all rivers are like this. I mean, the Thames is like that in London. There's something going on with energy as well with these. Uh, so anyway, you know, there's water towers in both places. Um, but I was really drawn there by the racing track. And yep. Sulphur Springs used to have a, um, a little park there. And Bush Gardens is in this same area. And this is where the race course is today, the Greyhound track that's it's been closed for a while. Um, Sulphur Springs was the northernmost terminus of the streetcar lines here. So you see that pattern developing. And again, that's something I'm finding over and over again. The you know, trolley tracks are removed. The evidence is gone. <laughs> course that one, <laughs> they that still have a little bit had, of a functioning one michelle that one video that you had where there's the tram lines in the middle of the the jungle and yes. no other, that's like proof positive <laughs> for sure that the narrative is shot De like no, definitely no I mean, other, <laughs> that's like yeah so when you say the the grid that's a logical thought progression that there were, we're on a grid we're on a some kind of lattice grid and you can harness it somehow the mechanism is unknown. I don't know. Obviously, they remove components, but I forget what video it is of yours. But it's like in the middle of. It's in the uh, middle of the jungle. It's Manaus in Brazil. It's in like Brazil, the heart of the, the Amazon rainforest. And there's and proof <laughs> of, of electric tram lines there, and there's, there's no other. There's no other like roads around, and it. it's like. <laughs> oh yeah, that was that was an eye opener for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's like that's another one of those ridiculous stories. <laughs> unbelievable. Um, like, we're the conspiracy theorists <laughs> for like pointing that out, like the unbelievably ridiculousness of it. Like, it was supposed to have been built in the 19th century by the European colonizers, and there's no roads there. <laughs> there's a road now, it's like 400 miles long, and it's like the, the worst road in Brazil. <laughs> but they had tram lines. <laughs> Electric um, trolley tram lines. Fascinating. So this is in uh, Sulphur Springs. So the 
the old Greyhound racing track is here. So we're talking about another ellipse. And then the uh, there's an, a, a track right here. And Bush Gardens is right here. Okay. And I, you know, I made a connection between Pirate. Bush Gardens and Shepherd's Bush. I mean, what's going on with the bush? But you know, so I'm starting to notice these geometric relationships with all of these ellipses. Your star tetrahedron, the flower of life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, this is Las Vegas. Imagine the electricity that's going on there. I mean, you know, there's something going on, and again, they're taking full advantage of it. Um. So I wanted to start there because that is leading me to find that same relationship between international airports and other airports even and racetracks. And then in doing the research for that, I'm also finding historical trolley parks and, and springs like hot springs and mineral springs. And they all seem to be connected together. Um, so I found this relationship to a, a racetrack that's a thoroughbred race, horse racing venue, uh, Toronto Pearson International Airport. Toronto? We have, here in we Toronto. Have, we have a, one of these old um, stadiums here, Michelle, old War Memorial mm -hmm. Stadium. Uh, it's called the mm -hmm. old Rock Tower where the Bills used to play, actually, and it was actually an old reservoir. I have a video on that. Yeah, and I mean, I, it's there to find. And I, I stumbled across this. I, I didn't have this. I didn't come up with this on my own. I, I guess I did in the sense that I recognized the similarity between the, uh, the racetrack in London and the airport and the one in Sulphur Springs in Tampa and the airport. That was when I first noticed it. And then people would leave me other suggestions. So these are all based on suggestions that people – made for me to look at. I love that you do that too. That's another part of, <laughs> another part of Michelle's show is it's very interactive, similar to MeWe, but people that write, I, I wish I could do, you know, I, it's cool for you because it, you, you, you go in and you dig out the um, recommendations from your people, your contributors and your commenters. It's so cool. It's been very productive because Again, these are places I would never think to look. I, I pretty much was sticking to the data points on my alignments that I found for my original research. And then when I started doing these series with comments that people have left me, I've, I've gone places I didn't even know about when I've looked at in a million years and, and finding a ton of really great examples and information. And that's what's happened with this series um, because of the recommendation of looking at Toronto um, there's a track over here, and it passes through where the Canadian Tower is. Um, there was a roundhouse park that's next to the CN Tower. Um, these roundhouses are amazing. Uh, so, the, so the railroad is there. You get the sports stadiums in Toronto, the professional sports stadiums. You have Fort York on one side of it. You know, So you've got what's clearly a star fort. And then, again, I'm going to just kind of scroll through, through some of these things. Beautiful roof. No it was said to have been built in 1933. Yeah, right. 9-3. Um, you know, that's a, yeah, come up with a lot of those numerology numbers in this research also. Yeah. And that's not an area of expertise for me, but it's fascinating for those that are able to apply it. Yeah, me neither, but those numbers do come out. Do you, I mean, do you notice it too, those, those three mm -hmm numbers i don't even need to say them they definitely do i mean yeah. it could be just literally i'm not saying any kind of negative connotation on it or a call it's literally i think it's just the way reality breaks itself down uh it's not bad or good at all if you see it actually it's probably a synchronistic good thing and they were just yeah for the most part but the controllers have used it against us exactly right and so it's it is exactly what you said by nature i mean I think creation is numbers. <laughs> um, right. So very important, but they've been manipulating it. And so this is an example of the jetties here by the RC Harris treatment plant that I'm going to show here in just a moment. And they look a lot, lot like what you see down in North Florida at Port Clinch. Yeah. And you know what, too? Uh, I'll, tie in, I'll tie in the next question too, Michelle, because, you know, a lot of these old pictures that we see, of these star forts have 
cathedrals in them. And, you know, we think of the healing mm -hmm. with the cathedrals, mm -hmm. and the cymatics that you've done actually in the videos that I watched. It's almost like some of the advertising of the cymatics is on these windows. Um, yeah, I think so. Think that's in conjunction with this energy and the, almost like a benevolent heal. I get, I get a sense of a benevolent healing energy. Not only um, are they heart, we don't know the mechanism of the component, but it seems like there were some kind of healing energies. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's what was going on. I mean, we were in harmony and resonance with each other and the universe. And that's what this whole setup was all about was, you know, creating that um, sympathetic resonance and, and creating healing. Um, so that's what got taken over. And, you know, lo and behold, right next to where the RC Harris treatment plant was, I found a historical trolley park. Um, of course. And, you yeah. know, here's another, yeah. here's the RC Harris water treatment plant. Um, here's where another amusement park was. So this is one, and this was another one. And then the end of the streetcar line is, is right here. And, you know, what is this, this beautiful water treatment plant? Um, you know, has these circular features <laughs> like here. Um, let me see if I got it. I don't know if I, I hope you guys can see my pictures because we see them. Right, <laughs> okay, right. good. Oh, well, that's uh, it. Can you guys see them on? Uh, can we get some confirmation? Campbell, thanks for stopping by, man. So you've got these earthworks and these this beautiful, huge building with very fancy brickwork on the front. Um, a lot of people had their pictures taken there, you know, at a water treatment plant, really. Um, and this is inside. Okay, thank you. We're what good. you see, what you see inside the water treatment plant, and it I, apparently it used to be open like one or two days a year where people could go in. So I guess that's when these pictures were taken. Um, you know, amazing on the outside, amazing on the inside. You know, there's another ellipse here. You have this old megalithic stone wall right here. Uh, somebody took these pictures for me and sent them. She lives here and she walked her dog through here and took pictures for me. That's the best. The boots so, on the ground. You can't yeah. be. <laughs> so shout out to Lisa H in Toronto for the pictures. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the, the Neville Street Loop for the Queen Street streetcar line is the eastern terminus of Toronto's longest streetcar route just off the northwest corner of the R.C. Harris Complex. You know, so there again, you have another terminus. So I, I think that the water treatment plant was a star for it. Here, you know, let um, me show you, can I show you something? Yeah. Let me just make a point here real quick and then go for it. So oh, yeah. um, so what they do is they just stick a plaque on it with a date <laughs> and all the people that were involved in building it. And so this was supposed to have been built starting in 1932 and became operational on November 1st of 1941, which would have, by the way, been during World War II and just a little over a month before the bombing of Pearl Harbor. You know, so again, the the stories are not computing. I, I just shared my screen. I stopped screen sharing. It's funny. So they put a plaque on it, right? What's the, when you go to the dentist, what are they, words have meaning. <laughs> um, I'll cite Crow 777 here. Words have meaning. What do you, what do they take off your teeth? Or they used to say uh, plaque off your teeth, right? Also tartar buildup, right? They, they, they tell you their intentions. Good point. <laughs> You know, I'm telling you. They, okay. they put, they put, give you a fluoride treatment. I mean, my mom's trying to be a good mom, so I had fluoride treatments twice a year when I was yeah. growing up. Speaking of which, you know, they what they're doing in these water treatment plants that used to take in. So this is, I think, that water treatment plant you want to talk about. Now, water treatment here in Buffalo. Now, here we are in Buffalo at the Porter Station. Okay, near that, near that Star Fort. Now, remember, we've addressed that the Star Fort is the Erie Basin Marina. Now, look what they have for you. You want to say those pumping stations, and you have these circular things here. Obviously, you have the baseball diamonds. Now, what I think, I found this picture, Michelle. And there used to be, excuse me, sorry about that, my word. Now, let's do this real quick. So there's the Erie Basin Marina on this old 1902 map, and you have the Erie Canal. This is the Erie Canal, and you see how they have a track here, similar to Cleveland has one like this too, right on the water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they're they're making it a smokestack, right? And the 
Notice how they make the Porter Ave station real non-discreet. Meanwhile, it's a massive building. It's, and it's, I, um, go, go back to that one real quick, Dustin. Okay, so uh, go up a little bit. And there's your, there's your ellipse right there. There's your ellipse, right? Okay. And we have in real time, they're, they're hiding these uh, circular things, whatever, in that map. Mm -hmm. I, I think those baseball. I think those baseball fields. I think football fields. I think. Um, I think they're all part of the circuitry. Now look at what they're. I'll show you an anomaly here. This this is um, that track, and I think this is Porter mm -hmm. Station. Now this picture is that it was actually a trolley. It says Powerhouse Buffalo Electric Street Railway. That's that building powerway. And in, in fact, it was actually. It's not. In my opinion, we're looking at it at the front of this picture right here. And it, it's not a smokestack one. It's actually electric tram car. Mm -hmm. So I think that they're hiding the fact that those electric railways were all over Buffalo too. Mm -hmm. um, definitely. And the, I think they were all definitely part of this system. Yep. The energy Absolutely. system. The cathedral. So mm -hmm. healing energy. You know, a lot of people think that they want, I guess, me too. I'm like, and I want the answers yesterday. We're, um, I can't give you the answers as to how they actually did that, you know, and, you know, transfused it into a human being or whatever, or, or if it was just the vibrations of being in there. You know, I, I think that the water itself running underground, if it's benevolent, I had a video that I shared before on my community tab that says the water intake of Buffalo has a very quiescent quality of the water, meaning that it's very um, tranquil, you know, even though it's a very fast running um, current Niagara, there's parts of it that you can grab from that have very pure water, I think, because the, there's an old theory that running water cleans itself, right? Um, and in with the whole inversion thing, I think people can get that benevolent energy. A lot of times I go down to the river right next to the current just to get my thoughts. I think there is a benevolent energy that comes off of that. And it, um, People can feel it, whether it's in the aether or you say the Akashic record, stuff like that. I think it's mm -hmm. um, tangible in a certain sense, physiologically, that people who are receptive to it actually can feel it and promote it, you know, benevolent. It could also be used negatively as well, but mm -hmm. what do you think about that? And um, your next question kind of ties into the one that I was just showing. And so I'd like to screen share Yep. And go through more examples of that angular relationship I was showing, as well as the, the cathedral windows and um, and how how that was all set up. So uh, let me, share uh, real quick. Let me ask. Do you want me to ask the next question? Get on to it. No, uh, sh go ahead and ask that question about the cathedrals. Okay. Uh, are many of the pics of the stars show cathedrals with uh, signature antiquitech. Uh, could these? not only have been power generators, were they also centers for cymatic vibrational healing? Like we were, there you go. Okay. I got that. I mean, so, for you. so let me go back to where I was because this is all tied together. Okay, so this is, uh, I'm gonna go answer that question, but I'm gonna show you some more relationships. Um, you've got the Los Angeles International Airport. Again, these were all suggestions that people left for me. Um, and you have an old racetrack, which was at Hollywood Park, that's been torn down. Um, and you've got the the main football stadium, the Forum, um, there in uh, Los Angeles. Um, this is in Baltimore. And same idea. And then the professional sports are over here. You also find railroad railroad tracks there right next to the stadiums. Uh, that's what Camden Yards used to look like. You know, I mean, just beautiful. They still have that, that used to be uh, rail yards. Wow. But they still have rail yards pretty close. Um, I'm gonna scroll down. Okay. This is in Sydney, Australia. <laughs> You've Cut got Sydney the International Airport, and you've got the Royal Randwick Race Course. Um, it's also a thoroughbred race course. Um, you've got something going on in Minneapolis. And the uh, the old Met Stadium is where the Mall of America is today. 
and if, you know, so this, this is the same relationship I was showing and I found tracks, but there's other things going on. So again, there's, I'm going to say a radial relationship or a geometric relationship and how these are all situated around the airport. Yeah. So I would say, um, you know, if you really had the, um, uh, I guess what uh, the tech or whatever to actually go through this. I, I believe I agree with you. They're probably all connected in the radio mm -hmm. flower pattern of life down to the radio sleep patterns. You know, so just in the examples I've shown so far, there's like seven places in different places around the world that have that same relationship. And then it speaks to that uh, realm wide one, you know, empire or um, civilization or culture because they're building in the same way. You know, mm -hmm. um, so this is this that. is this part of it gets into your question, and yeah, I mean, it, it definitely it's it's. I don't have time to look at every single airport and look for a track, so that's why following up on people's suggestions is so helpful. But I'm, I'm sure if I did, <laughs> it I would find it exactly. Um, so um, I'm looking at um. So I'm not an electronics person. <laughs> I'm intuitive. And so I, I looked up ellipses and sure enough, I found ellipses and circuit boards. And then I found the term elliptical polarization, which has to do with magnetic fields. And again, I think this is an electromagnetic system. And I found these um, elliptical antenna, which you find with satellite dishes and ultra wideband communications. And when I was looking up this information, Dustin, it's when I found this radio actually an axial axial ratio of two antenna. And as soon as I saw that graph, it made me think of cathedral windows. Absolutely. Look at that. <laughs> you great, know? Great sign there. Wow. And again, that was like what I found when I was looking for this information on ellipses. Just, and that was, um, and that right. was go ahead, I'm sorry. No, just like hip fire, you're going through something and you randomly mm -hmm. say something that is a pivotal, uh, crucial piece of the information or a data point, like you say. Excellent. And so this was the article where I found this diagram of elliptical polarization is where I found this diagram, okay. which brought that to mind. Cathedrals. And then somebody sent me this diagram of what looks like a relationship between cathedral doors and octaves, the intervals, intervals between one musical pitch and another with double its frequency. You know, so you've got the same looking appearance with these cathedral doors that you do with this uh, diagram of Walter Russell's. And I highly recommend looking into his work um, because this dude's been cut out of the, his, you know, our education, but he seems to know what's going on. And I'm going to be working to try to understand what all this means. Cause I, I really, I can't quite grasp what R Walter Russell's series are, are telling us. I just grasping that it's hugely important. Torrent, um, torrent energy and um, is related in electromagnetism. Yeah. Super, super interesting. And I, I tend to believe that as a model of how reality works now um, under, you know, obviously, you know, my um, creation is I'm, I'm a Christian. But I believe it is more an electrical realm that would abide to gravity, or that is what you would explain uh, gravity, as opposed to, in my opinion, large bodies falling, continuously falling around each other, like the Newtonian physics. I, mm -hmm. At one point in time, I did agree with that and believe in that. I don't anymore, and I would cite Walter Russell and um, you know, even the um, Thunderbolts project you know, with their electrical work stuff, but um, very fascinating. That's what I tend to agree now with, with as well. And Walter mm -hmm. Russell, I would definitely recommend looking him up too, for sure. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, again, saying that humanity was way more advanced than what we've been told, you know, we're not talking about ancient aliens here. You know, if anything, we're talking about uh, an advanced humanity that had a relationship with positive aliens, but not, that aliens built all of this. Um, and so you have that same pattern. Um, this shows up in New Caledonia, which is near Australia. Um, it shows up in Finland. It shows up in England 
and it shows up in New York City. Um, and that brings me to the, the, the Cathedral Rose Windows, where you see the similarity between um, the cymatic patterns of the piano notes and Cathedral Rose Windows. Wow. Yeah. And you know what? Actually, wow. Some people who are zooming in on the luminaries and the stars with the P900 or whatever, they look similar to mm -hmm. what you're showing there. And then there's solfeggio frequencies, which are the healing frequencies that you're talking about. Um, and they make up an ancient six tone scale that's used in sacred music, like Gorian chants and Tibetan singing bowls. And yeah. solfeggio frequencies, um, like 396 hertz um, from, let's see, from grief into joy, liberation from guilt and fear. And 417 is above situations and facilitate change. 528 hertz is transformation and miracles and restoring DNA. 639 hertz um, is relationships and connection to spiritual family. And 741 hertz is expression and solution, uh, clearing and truth. Um, and then you have these two that aren't highlighted. Um, 174 hertz reduces pain. 285 hertz influences energy fields. And then above this, uh, 852 hertz returns to spiritual order and intuition and 963 hertz awaken original perfect state. Um, but they've suppressed solfeggio frequencies. <laughs> they changed the tuning from 430 to, for example, to 440 and, and just made it discordant, which affects us. That's an interesting <laughs> point to make is where that's why when we go into this research and pull out the fact that I say a lot of times I say that the phrase I use is a benevolent one world realm or um, you know empire or whatever, if you will, because mm -hmm. we see the characteristics of what their society um, appears to have been with things like this or organs and cathedrals, like they mm -hmm. cared about people's uh, well, be well being so much so that they actually built it into their, I would say logos into their architecture. Right. And, um, their infrastructure actually and here we go with the our history that we paint over it or you know the academic bottleneck of it and we say that it was all for war mm -hmm. and for and for bad and it's completely and there that's just a hallmark a fingerprint of the inversion i mean it's so apparent now in my opinion and that's why there's utility in continuing this research some might say not and that you might look at this research and say it's all a lie and what's the point? Matter of fact, I, I think the complete opposite because there always is truth laid out. And if Logos is baked in, it's going to leave a wake of truth that mm -hmm. can be pulled from. Um, and again, and this, this, this is all stuff that I found when I was researching other comments. So somebody suggested I look into, uh, he actually suggested I look into Salem Willows Park, which, which used to be a trolley park. <laughs> Um, but that brought me to this Salem Witch Museum. And that's not a castle. That's not a church. That's the Salem Witch Museum. Oh, boy. You know, and so you've got these beautiful cathedral windows. And you've got these terrible exhibits. And at the Witch Dungeon Museum, you know, you have that, you know, the same style of cathedral window. And you've got an organ. And I think organs were part of this. And then you've got these exhibits at the Witch Dungeon of people in prison and hanging, you I know. <laughs> so Whoa. it's like the the lower vibrational imagery that they are imprinting on us instead of providing the uplifting and healing experiences. They want this to be what we think about ourselves and about our history. Well, that's what I did in my, in the, in the first Erie Basin Marina is like I, that it, it they seem to be always commemorating I understand to address, you know, accidents, but there, I mean, it just seems to be the theme of our entire, um, at least administrative, uh, it, to, mm -hmm. and so, um, so there's the Duke university chapel, you know, see how beautiful it is on the inside. And it was said to have been built in, um, let me see. It first opened. They didn't say built. It said first opened in 1932. Oh, yeah, there you go. That's another okay. occupation of history. Yeah. 
Yeah, and then there's these, you know, four beautiful organs in the in the uh, chapel, and a fifty bell carillon. He's so. What I said after that, it is a fully equipped and functioning frequency generator. And and I think that's what these big tall buildings, especially the ones with bell towers, were doing. They were, you know, they're very very high. Not all of these are bell towers, um, <laughs> but the bell towers tend to just go way, way up into the sky. And I think they were generating these beautiful healing frequencies for for all. And they were somehow connected together. Interesting um, call bell towers, too, because, again, words have meaning. And now we call them bell frees, which means bell free. There's not a bell in there in a lot of these anymore because they're taken away. Mm-hmm. They're bell free. And so here you have an example of a church in Ohio where you have the organ directly underneath the cathedral rose window. Okay. And again, I believe that represents a healing frequency. And so what's the meaning of organ? It means instrument or tool, a collection of tissues that structurally form for a specialized function unit to perform a particular function. And so I think that's probably what that is doing. It's a, a musical instrument and the window is a frequency being broadcast for its particular function in the collective system. And it literally heals uh, living human beings, organs. Words have right. meaning. Right. Um, oh yeah. So, so what uh, I wanted to say, I'm sorry. It seems that we can memorialize accidents <laughs> instead of promoting uh, beautiful things. You know, like we, there was one thing that the Stonehenge in the, uh, marina is commemorating the the Irish potato famine, you know, and then a stone <laughs> throw, and then a stone right. throw away. They had the Sullivan ships, which commemorates uh, the horrible accident where three brothers were were lost at, on the same ship. You know, it's like it seems to be a theme of memorializing accidents. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. I well, think I've kind of come to the end of that, but that that would answer your question. Um, you know, again, I want to thank everybody who left me comments because I wouldn't have had that realization without people taking the time to make suggestions. Absolutely. And it just, it just snowballed from there. And that's how the work, the work is moved forward because it's, uh, you know, these people who are leaving comments, like I say with, um, when they, when I promote and want people to come over to my, the, the MeWe thing, because you can have, this stuff right outside your door and there's nothing mm-hmm. stopping you from taking a picture or leaving a comment on Michelle's videos and she would go right into it and hammer on it. You know, it's, it's invaluable. And again, there, it also underlines why there is utility in continuing this research. Now, um, I just want to say a shout out to fellow researcher, Bernard Conkin. He's amazing. Check out his uh, YouTube oh, cool. channel. And he, he and I are going to solve this mystery. Bernard. <laughs> Yep, Bernard. He's Bern I, the third eye science guy, and he is nice. just amazing. Welcome, Bernard. He's he's an expert on Walter Russell, so oh, we're going to be digging into that and other things as well. I'll probably send you like fifty emails by the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, that's another thing too. It's a good point to note, though. Don't be afraid to send an email. That's how I was uh, got in communication mm-hmm. with you, Michelle. You know, and mm-hmm. everybody that I looked up to when I first entered into this. Um, by hitting a, a YouTube channel, yourself, even Phil uh, Campbell, um, UAP. Uh, there's so many that I'm not mentioning, but um, I feel grateful that I'm interviewing you now, and it's very cool, mm-hmm. full circle. So, let's go. Let's see where are we at the next question. Um, cathedrals, you think, and and the radial grid patterns. I think that we have addressed that. I I, I think that the radial grid patterns are ex- um, radiating out from the center of these um, star forts and Again, the narrative behind them is kind of confusing because mm-hmm. the Ellicott brothers, is that what we have the question? Matter of fact, let's just read this. Do you uh, think sometimes uh, the accompanying radial street grid patterns emanating from the center point, usually a square with a monument or obelisk even, are related to stars? Uh, and, and in a bigger sense, are the radial street patterns a part of the Earth grid system? I think that we did address that. How was the ancient it's, advanced civilization aware of aware of that grid pattern too? That's another good they, they just, I mean, they knew who they were. They knew where they were. They knew why they were here. There was no question about that. 
you know what? Um, I, I can. I, I like to dovetail on that a little bit in the sense that we were talking about before we started this, how we have a general rise in uh, consciousness and we want to say the aether has gotten thicker. We're having more synchronicity. Um, I think it, a lot of, they were able to do a lot of these buildings because it ha comes down to the morality of the people. Right. And you're able to come together and maybe if you didn't have to worry about nine to five work and whatever, I know it's a whole paradigm shift, but literally you had to start thinking like that because in, or in order mm -hmm. for people to come together to make, stuff like this you have to have a very morally um aligned uh society because it has mm -hmm. to be able to um come together and for example to compare contrast with what right now this we would not be able to build these cathedrals now but maybe at some point in time not taking into account the history of things and how things go up and or a, a slow progression from you know darwinism if you will it could just be it could be a series of ups and downs and it, it lends to the reset thing and up you feel the timeline. And and really to really receive this information and to open yourself up to it, you have to be comfortable with releasing and accepting that everything we've been told is a lie. You have to be you have to be comfortable with that because when you do that, the information starts to come in and when you start seeing what's there. It starts coming in and berserker bear and i did a an interview not too long ago on um, do-it-yourself field research and anybody can do this <laughs> you know and once you start doing it, it it you will get information back but you have to see things differently and question what you've been told and yeah. that's key and don't be afraid to send an email if you're mm -hmm. interested um I get a lot of them. I, I try to respond back as much as I can, but we need the scope, you know, and like I said, there is utility in to keep on doing the research. So yeah, yeah. radio patterns. <laughs> yeah. Just look, uh, look at major cities from Google earth. And a good one is Paris, France, um, because the arch de triomphe, which actually has the name of star in it, um, is at the center of this gigantic radial pattern going out. And um, there's everything is, is really lined, in alignment with it. It's laid out beautifully. Um, but if you look at any major city, you're going to see that. You're going to see that in Washington, D.C. You're going to see that in London. Um, I said Buffalo, like you've talked about. Um, I want to let you show more of your research that you've got pulled up. But there is one thing that I want to mention that you had on your miscellaneous <laughs> off-topic points. Yes. Because it's just another indicator. And I want to talk about the Ames brothers if I may. Absolutely. <laughs> and I found this following an alignment. So I'm going to share my screen real quick and, and go through it as quickly as I can, because your, your research is awesome. And, um, you know, we, we just kind of synchronistically bounce off of each other. Oh, uh, let's see. Can you see me? Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Let me figure out where I put the Ames brothers here. This is not that uh, let's see that one. Oh, and there's one of uh, one other one I want to show. This is Philadelphia. <laughs> this right here is the waterfront in Philadelphia. Tell me, does that not look like ancient Rome or Greece? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, I'm looking for the Ames brothers. Okay, so I found the Ames brothers right off the bat when I looked at Easton, Massachusetts, when I was tracking an alignment from Washington, D.C. And it's a long distance circular alignment that takes me to a lot of different places. And right off the bat, I found the Ames Shovel Works. It became nationally known for providing the shovels for the Union Pacific Railroad, which, was, which opened the West. And it was said to have been the world's largest supplier of shovels in the 19th century. Tell me, if you're building a rail, railroad, why would shovels be so important or were they digging it out which is what i think and uh, this is the oaks ames memorial hall that was said to have been commissioned by the children of oaks ames as a gift to the town of easton and built between 1879 and 1881 and then the leap um so this guy richardson henry hobson richardson is given the credit for the architecture and he was given the credit for a lot of different places let me tell you, a genius guy. Um, but he never finished his architecture studies. <laughs> he was in Paris, but because of the Civil War, he never finished. 
and he died at the age of 47. Of course, Civil War is always pivotal. <laughs> After a prolific career in the design of mind-blowingly sophisticated and ornate buildings of heavy masonry. Um, I'm going to scroll through some of my uh, sidetracks here. And then he was also given the credit for the, the, the Ames Free Library right next to it. That were that was commissioned by this guy, the brother of Oaks, um, that he left will for the money for the construction of a library in his will, and that that was built between 1877 and 1879. Okay, so o Oliver and um, um, I'm sorry, Oliver and Oaks were the co-owners of the Ames Shovel Shop, and he was the president of the Union Pacific Railroad from when it. For, it met the Central Pacific Railroad in Utah for the completion of the first transcontinental railroad in North America. So Oak Sames was a member of the U.S. Congress House of Representatives from Massachusetts from 1863 to 1873 and is credited by many as being the most important influence in building the Union Pacific portion of the first transcontinental railroad. And he was also involved in the Credit Mobilier scandal of 1867 regarding the improper sale of stock of the railroad's construction company. Ah, oh, apology. <laughs> he was formally censured by, uh, censured by Congress in 1873 for his involvement in the scandal, and he died that same year. But he was exonerated by the Massachusetts State Legislature in 1883, which was the 10th anniversary of the completion of the railroad. And Ames, Iowa and Ames, Nebraska were ne named after Oaks. The criminal, the criminal right? And this is the Ames Monument near Laramie in Wyoming, which is also credited to Henry Hobson Richardson and built between 1880 and 1882 for their role in financing the Union Pacific Railroad. How is that any different from today? <laughs> with what's going on? I mean, always been shady, right? But I mean, that whole story is just, um, you know, a really great example of, you know, something's not right here. It, bounce, it bounces off with the Ellicott brothers, and they're always brothers because they can have the narrative in two different places at the same time, I think. Um, mm -hmm. because, uh, there's Ellicott brothers, the dudes that did Buffalo, the radio street pattern in Buffalo, allegedly, in um, 1804, when uh, it was the village of Buffalo before that. Actually, matter of fact, they did call it New Amsterdam, which is confusing because they called New York City New, Am New Amsterdam also. But Buffalo, mm -hmm. the village of Buffalo was also... <laughs> called new amsterdam before holland uh land purchase bought it but um yeah allegedly ellicott uh joseph ellicott is responsible for doing the radial street pattern here in buffalo and i'd like to play those clips right now regarding that because you know the ellicott brothers allegedly joseph did the one in Washington, D.C. as well. And that's why they have similar street names or whatever, allegedly, you know. It's just very convenient, like we were saying before. It doesn't add up, you know. And, of course, there's also Olmstead brothers, like the um, Robert Law Olmstead in the parks here. Of course, they were brothers, too. So, okay. Now, what I'm going to do here is show a video of me... Um, Check the audio file, member. Share audio. Now, these are uh, videos of um, like academic videos where professors are doing um, presentations about the history of Buffalo. And I pulled out a good one here and I want to play it. I think it's he realized class. that the future. He... Now, he's talking about Joseph Ellicott here, I believe. Realized that the future. Western New York was in Buffalo, not in Batavia. So he decided to establish a road system <clears throat> um, that he felt would spur economic development, which had currently not met ex expectations. He liked the concept of running avenues at acute angles, like spokes radiating, radiating from a hub, an idea first implemented by the Ellicott brothers at the federal capitol in Washington, D.C. Allegedly, like they want to take it off of the like old European styles. They, they give them the credit for that. So when the time came to lay out Buffalo streets, Ellicott used the same system spreading from a hub 
that is Niagara Square today. Uh, this is an old map of the Holland Land Company purchase. So there you go. Joseph Ellicott is credited for the radial street pattern in Buffalo. Meanwhile, I think that it was dug out, like we were saying, whether it was from a liquefaction event, I think that might bring us into the next question. He's also responsible for um, the Erie Canal as well. And you know what? I might as well play the other the other one here with, with, along with this. Yeah, go for it. I've been hogging the time. Okay, thank you. Oh, you have a comment? Yeah. Okay, thanks. This is, in, this is interesting. Okay, moving ahead in time, December 30th, 1813, I think a day that will live in Buffalo history. On December 10th of that same year, General George McClure who was a commander of American forces in the Niagara area, senselessly burned the Canadian town of Newark, Newark, which was now uh, Niagara on the lake. Then he retreated from the west side of the river the settlers on the American side protested this burning of a defenseless town, an act of cruelty, but feared retaliation. But sure enough, the British forces, augmented by Native Americans, crossed the river and surprised Fort Niagara and proceeded to destroy Lewiston. Two days later, they continued marching up the river, destroying the villages of Manchester, which is now Niagara Falls, Stopping at Tynawanda Creek, where the bridges were destroyed by retreating American forces. So the villages of Black Rock and Buffalo were still on edge, but they were saved for now. They garnered militia forces from Genesee and Chautauqua counties, which came in to defend Buffalo and confidence returned. However, this quickly <clears throat> went on December 30th. It was realized they were no match for the British and Indian forces that quickly took and burned the villages of Black Rock and then Buffalo. Panic-stricken, most residents fled the village, and all that was left were a few resistors, which were eventually killed or taken prisoner, all due to the senseless act of General George McClure. So Buffalo had to rebuild, and Joseph Ellicott was a big part of that rebuilding. He was a major player by this time. Uh, he contributed personal funds as well as many company funds. And he served on a commission with the state legislature, um, uh, which, which was created to help war victims. This is also a reason you'll, you will not find any building in Buffalo with a cornerstone prior to 1813. Everything was destroyed and rebuilt uh, around that. Everything was so that, that that's kind of the crux of everything was. So is that the reason why so every single building that I see that has two different layers of construction was what literally raised from that that fire? That's highly, highly uh, suspect, in my opinion, um, just for the regular um, timeline of events that they say happen here in Buffalo, because when I go and rub my nose on these buildings, I always apply that Brian Forrester quote that I said earlier, you know, so it's certainly confusing. Um, and the, the sermon is very key here with that. But when I hear something like that, you know, my peer, uh, definitely perked my ears. What do you, what do you think about that? What do you, what do you deduce from that, Michelle? <laughs> that they're lying. <laughs> uh, let me, let me show you another example along those lines. Here, here let me uh, stop sharing. Absolutely. Okay. And again, in the interest of keeping it short, um, I'm going to share about Fort Washington and Fort Lee in uh, Fort Washington's on the Manhattan side of the Hudson River and Fort Lee is on the New Jersey side. Okay. And I just have to find that particular one. I think it's this one. And they took down all these inclines too. I mean, there's some left. There's the ones in, Phil in uh, Pittsburgh. Oh, you know what? Um, um, I, got, those are, I got a cool picture for you. Okay, Some let me... Uh, research on uh, the Niagara Falls that I got to do. I had to do another uh, 2.0 and uh, go back at JP, get back mm -hmm. on the trail at JP Morgan. Um, yeah, definitely. Follow that guy. <laughs> yeah, I got to for sure. I'm, I'm hot on this trail. Follow um, the money. <laughs> um, so there's a whole chain of star forts. Um, starting in northern New York, going down the Hudson River, and and most of them aren't there anymore. Um, 
and they got destroyed during the Revolutionary War, go figure, or the French and Indian War. Um, but I'm going to this one because of what they told us. <laughs> so what they told us about um, Fort Washington and was that another it was plaque. a fortified, I'm another sorry? Plaque. Another plaque. <laughs> yeah, another plaque. Um, Fort Washington was a fortified position at the island's highest point near the north end of Manhattan, said to have been constructed to prevent the British from going up river starting in June of 1776. Wait, I'm sorry, I'm laugh when I read this. Starting in June of 1776, <laughs> by Pennsylvania battalions of the Continental Army for General George Washington. <laughs> Fort Lee, also known as Fort Constitution, was said to have been constructed starting in July of 1776 on top of a bluff on the Hudson Palisades directly across the river from where Fort Washington was being built at the same time on the other side. <clears throat> All of the hard work needed to build these fortifications came to nothing since we were told that in November of 1776, that same year in the Battle of Fort Washington, troops under the command of British General William Howe and Hessian General Wilhelm von Knipphausen made short work of the American forces stationed there, captured both forts, and took over 2,800 American prisoners, of which only around 800 were said to have survived after being kept in substandard conditions on board British ships in New York Harbor. That's seriously what they tell us. <laughs> they Some built the forts. Yeah. <laughs> using the same format almost, you know? And they like were captured right away. <laughs> Um, so it's, 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 um, <laughs> hard not to chuckle to yourself, Michelle, when you're actually, I completely understand. It's like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. They, they really? have to look into it, I guess, or add it, add it up. <laughs> and guarantee if you go visit those places, I'm sure that's what they say. <laughs> exactly. Yep. So that's why we have right to question, right? When, um, just by logical deduction. Okay. Um, then let me show you this cool picture actually. Oh boy, where is it? The Lewis, the, you had a cool picture of the Lewiston Incline, and I found this one doing my research on uh, Niagara Falls. Man, I'll tell you, when I'm doing research on this mm -hmm. place, I honestly get a feeling of uh, like Huck Finn meets um, Huck Finn, Tom Sawyer meets Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> Great analogy. <laughs> Check it out. Look at that. So, this is a. a old depiction of the Lewiston incline, that one picture that you had uh, going through your homework that you gave me. I'm like, oh, that looks similar to the one that I found. I'm like, oh, it is the old Lewiston incline. And I found this one in the old book on archive.org. And look at that. So you have an incline going all the way up the, this is a lower Niagara gorge here, up to a uh, pulley system. And whatever they were doing here, I'd be pull, probably pulling some stuff out. Um, yeah, I just get the feeling that this, this place was a lot more like whimsical. You get like a Huck, Huck Finn, Jack Sparrow esque type of deal with this. It's just, it's fascinating. And it, that's what drives me to do the research, Michelle, is finding stuff like this, you know, and then mm -hmm. watching a video of yours and I see something that looks like it. I'm like, oh, that is it. You know, you make those connections, it's very special. And it's those synchronistic uh, clicks that we get that kind of confirm the hunches sometimes when you're doing research, you know. I'm sure you can speak to that. Yeah, I mean, synchronicity is a huge part of this. Huge. Okay, so yeah. let's uh, – oh, go ahead. No, I'm, just, I'm done. Okay, yeah, um, moving right along, let's go to the next question. Do you think um, – and this comes from one of the one of my fellow bears, bear, paplegic bear. Shout out to you, my man. Uh, and this is a great, um, I think – deduction because of the way that they're shaped but i know they're on hills might be a little counterintuitive but uh can they have been drains uh from the flood you know some visually appear similar to drains with the many narrow openings um same with the water towers you know the little slits almost like they could be used to drain uh with the whole underworld idea and the piranesi underworld dungeon pictures that uh, martin Lidka has shared before and they do seem some of these star forts to be depressed underground. Now, I wonder, not necessarily for drains, but it makes me think of, you know how the cannonballs were saying that they were being shot at them? It almost looks, so I think 
in my opinion, Michelle, for those hydraulic mining, uh, mining monitors, they may have been pointing those at these old castles and, and literally just using, because cannonballs would, would add up, gunpower would add up. If they can literally just canal and use monitors to um, shoot at these castles, well, the next uh, a progression, I think, in defense would be to have sloping things. That actually could be more of a defense for um, shielding and shedding water if if the monitors were used as weapons, as I as I suspect they may have been. I, I see it as being a benevolent civilization. Um, so whatever functions, and not only the stars, but all of the infrastructure had, it was, I think, for positive purposes. Um, I mean, after all the research that I've done, that's the only conclusion that I can come to is that they weren't fighting each other. They were they were creating great beauty together. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not, you know, deflecting from what you're saying as much as I'm sure things had many different functions, but it was a, a very, a very healthy, uh, very functional society that was reconnecting with, you know, their higher selves. And, you know, like I said, they, they knew who they were, so they weren't distracted by, by the things that we have to distract us, like, you know, having to work and, uh, yeah. watching watching TV or watching movies or going to the ball game or playing cards. You know, there's this guy around Sedona. See him all the time. He's walking along and he's an expert with tossing a knife. And he's, he spends all of his time, you know, with this routine that he's got and he, you know, never drops it. He's perfect with it. But I'm, I, the last time I saw him thinking, is that, is that how you're spending your life? <laughs> you know? Um, and you know, that's kind of what is we, we focus on doing the best that, that we can, and we're not here to be consumers and spending all this money and giving the people that have done this money for what they've done. I mean, we're paying them to, to do the crap that they've done. Um, we were here to reconnect with ourselves, with, with spirit, with each other and, um, and I don't think it was a, a civilization that was fighting. I think that was the narrative we were given. But it all it all had some kind of purpose for sure. I agree. And, you know, there's an interesting comment that I had in one of my videos that kind of tails off of this. With what you said about being benevolent and they probably weren't warring. And it seems to me that if you did want to have less of an aggressive uh, stance on something, you would... Um, instead of firing cannonballs at a structure, maybe a less aggressive tone, I guess, if you will, will be washing it out with water. I don't know, because I, I can't get off. I can't move away from the fact that they may have used those monitors for weapons and a lot of the destruction that we see some of these old um, um, cities or whatever they say were fires and it, there's all mud around. I mean, what's to stop them? Literally, what's to stop them from using these monitors on cliffs, wall cliffs, to get metalliferous veins out than just pointing them at a city that they want to take over, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I always keep that as an option. And and the way that the star forts are shaped, angling, the way that the mainstream says that they were angled to deflect cannonballs, maybe it was more so to deflect water. But I agree, though. Uh, I think that it was a benevolent uh, civilization. They they were they weren't trying to war with each other, and maybe that the actual uh, formation of these star forts was actually more inclined with uh, to be one with nature and have the more healing. Mm -hmm. And um, that's up certainly up for debate. But I I do agree with the whole benevolent aspect of it as well. But at a certain level, they probably were being you know usurped and, and taken over. So there of of course this some discernment. That's what that, happened. Yeah. That's what happened. We went from heaven on earth to hell on earth. <laughs> Seemingly. And hopefully when they flipped it. <laughs> yeah, hopefully the work that we're doing here is, you know, um, helping to shorten that, you know. Um, I'm going to go to the next one because it has to do with the buffalo. Um, mm -hmm. the, buffalo the, the buffalo and the whole, I'll sh uh, the whole dismantled, allegedly, star fort that we see here. Um, in the eighth ward, this would be the eighth ward. Let's actually show a picture of that. So 
So this is the Erie Basin Marina right here. And this is the Erie Basin Marina here. Now, regarding the Buffalo dismantled star fort in the 8th Ward, and uh, three other clearly visible star forts with the Fort Erie one, and Fort George is right across from Fort, you know what, Fort George, I'll send it, show you a picture of, is across from Fort Erie. Okay, that's or across from Old Old Fort Niagara is the one on the uh, Ontario Lake Ontario, and you had uh, Old Fort Niagara, and the one that's right across from that one is Old Fort George. Now, I believe I did have a picture of that one. Here it is. This one in the foreground is Fort George in Canada, and the one in the background is Old Fort Niagara on Lake Ontario. Those are the two on the lower part of the river, Michelle, and okay. the two on the upper part are uh, Fort Erie and the Buffalo Hidden one. Okay, so... Okay, I'm getting confused here. This is Lake Ontario right here. Fort Niagara and Fort George is in this. See, it's all gone now, of course, right? It was that. Now it's completely... I mean, I'm sure there's... Oh, there it is. There you go. That's Fort George. And then all the way down at the head, you obviously have... Fort Erie is a little bit smaller. This is a small star. And they hid the Buffalo one, of course. So go back to my question. I addressed all the other uh, four star forts in our region. Do you think, okay, also incorporating Niagara Falls and the whole Lewiston thing, and even out to Depew, where I think that the water lines went to, and I think that the radio patterns and there might have even been canals going inland. Um, and this is another idea that my boy, Mr. Brees popped out to me because the radio street pattern in Buffalo also were the only city in the Northeast rust belt of cities, if you will, Chicago, Philadelphia, New York city, even we're the only one that has a uh, sunset over the water, which is the long way of Lake Erie, um, incorporating all that to me, it seems like, and you've done, you have your history of research in the Moorish Tartary, um, I believe it's possible that, you know, this region might be a uh, capital of this old world that we're researching, you know, or at least a mega hub of it because it has to do with all the water and all the railroad lines that are in and throughout Buffalo. What do you say to that, Michelle? You know, I think very, very, very possibly. Um, I want to sh uh, share my screen again just for a second. I, I think Washington, D.C. might have been the actual capital. Um, and I'll show you why, but I do think um, what you're saying has extreme merit, you know, that, I mean, I think these cities, you know, we you look at the word electricity, electric or electricity, you know, the cities were, you know, a big part of this energy generation. I mean, even New York City, um, like I, I found numerous star forts between, um, uh, on the Hudson River um, from north to south. And then when I did previous research on on lower and upper Hudson Bay, I found eight star forts between the entrance of lower New York Bay and the entrance of the Hudson River. There you go. And that includes um, the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island as well. Okay. Um, so I found, you know, four pairs between that in that distance. And then I found let's say 10 more pairs or 12 more pairs on up the Hudson river. Um, you know, so that's telling me something. I'm not exactly sure what, but that was a very powerful area. Um, and I just wanted to show you what I found in Washington, DC and why I think it may have been selected as the capital. There you go. Um, is because when you look at all of this going on in this real estate in DC, and so I was drawn to look at the area around the Tidal Basin and you have the White House, you have the Ellipse, you have the Washington Monument, you have the Lincoln Memorial, the Reflection Pool, you have the Thomas uh, Jefferson Memorial, 
that's just in that one part. And so I looked at it on Google Earth and this is the White House here. It goes right through the ellipse, like cutting it right in half. And it connects with the Jefferson Memorial down here. There you go. And then you've got the Lincoln Memorial and it goes right through the Washington Monument. And this is the US Capitol right here. And that's just in one part of DC. You know, and again, like I said, you have radial patterns here and everything else. Um, and this is, the ellipse is the exact geographic center of DC is in this area here. Boom. Yeah, you know, you always hear about the compass and the <laughs> square in, in DC, mm -hmm. little less known radials here, Michelle's pointing out for you. Yeah, you know what? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I disagree with that either. Um, the whole north and south thing, maybe uh, this was the northern uh, node, right? Uh, but we could, yeah, I mean, you know, what if they put the obelisk down in the capital? I, you know, I, we're just, you know, proposing here, but yeah, yeah. I, I certainly, certainly see that as well, for sure. So, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we have all we can do is, is postulate here you know, based on what we've experienced. Um, I just want to share one more thing here before I, I stop screen sharing. And that is, um, this is from my exposing exhibitions, expositions, and world fairs since 1851. And you had mentioned the Corliss steam engine in your optopic op questions. Yep. <laughs> uh, so it was said to have been invented by George Henry Corliss and patented in 1849. And is a steam engine with rotary valves and variable valve timing and is 30% more fuel efficient than conventional steam engines. Okay, this was... Um, the full one and it powered this 1400 horsepower engine was on display and generated all the energy used in the machinery hall during the Philadelphia 1876 exhibition. Where did it go? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> who knows? Um, and so I had put these views up that I found when I was researching it of what it looked like from different angles. And somebody left me a comment and said, that looks like a Vimyana, which is an ancient flying machine. And I looked it up, and sure enough, it does. It does. <laughs> Go back. You know, you've got the same yeah. shape. <laughs> you've got the same same thing going on here. Makes me think of Pravin you know? Mohan's channel. <laughs> Great channel. So that was a that was another find that was kind of startling. Antiquatech. And you know what? Here, let me uh, bounce off that. And what I'll do, Michelle, is to, so we can get it, wrap this up. What I'll, I'll do the I'll do the top um, the top point, bullet point, and the off topic points, so we can round in our friend John. And mm -hmm. uh, let me uh, share this too, right quick. Go off the core list. So this is on the Library of Congress map. All roads lead to Buffalo. That I use in my intro, my little quick intro video that Mr. Brees made for me. Um, look what it says on here, Michelle. Have a chat with a phonograph. A magnificent cordless engine supplies the power that keeps all belts and wheels of machinery hall in motion. You can think of no mechanical industry which is not represented. Yonder is a great uh, perfecting printing press, turning out thousands of copies of newspapers. Every article in which has been written, put in type, and stereotyped on the fairgrounds before your eyes. That was all powered by that coreless uh, wireless engine. You know, and what is, again, words have meaning. What does coreless sound like? Cordless. You know, cordless mm -hmm. phone. Um, fascinating. So that's a good sync right there, too. On the map that um, I'm using for Electric Dow is asking a question about the Star Force being portals to the underworld. Uh, you know, definitely. I mean, Possibly. there's so many things we don't know, uh, wormholes and and that kind of thing. And I, t I tend to think they were that sort of like a battery function. Um, and I'm going to share one more time real quick. Sure. You know what? But again, they, like I said before, they could have had more than more than one use. So um, they had technologies and new things we we can only imagine and write stories about. Did you point that one out to segue us into the, the last one? Because that's perfect. 
<laughs> no, but I saw the comment. Um, so a battery, um, also called galvanic battery or voltaic battery, is a combination of two or more cells electrically connected to work together to produce electric energy. Um, and I think I saw where you came in late, electric dial, but um, the star forts occur in combinations of pairs or more. There's at least two star forts and or more. And so I tend to think they were, um, you know, that they were functioning some kind of, in some kind of capacity as circuitry. But saying that the civilization knew all about portals and, and things like that. I, I mean, think that could still fit under the same roof, Michelle. Like it could be a general a portal, but it could also <laughs> be, they could also have be uh, entrance ways to tunnels. That could perfectly be feasible that they are also their dual purpose or maybe even triple purpose. Um, yeah, the whole Piranesi underworld um, artistic renderings, again, that I've uh, cited that Martin Liedke has, has shown and showcased before, that's absolutely fascinating. And that kind of does bring me into what I like, uh, how I'd like to wrap this up um, in the spirit of another phenomenal researcher who brought me into this uh, whole um, rabbit hole, if you will, John Levi, Um another fascinating researcher. I, I really look up to his work as well. And in the spirit of his second channel, the off topic, John Levi off topic. Well, this isn't necessarily off topic because it's still on star forts, but he had a, um, he showcased star forts. I couldn't find this video um, where he, he referenced a, a, another channel, IRS media, who was actually going and mapping 3d star forts all over. And it kind of looked like, the actual substrate of the realm itself was made of nodules of these star forts and they pop out of the terra or the substrate, whatever you will, or even the crust. Um, we're not getting into that debate really. Um, but I thought it was fascinating because it does lend credence to that idea that there might be an underground interlaced tunnel system and the top and the surface is connected with these nodules of star forts that are maybe in line with your, your your flower of life pattern and i thought that was a good um video that i'll cite and i'll try to find that one and share it as above so below <laughs> right that whole that that whole right. idea as well and that everything's connected and interconnected by a lattice of a flower pattern and flower of life like everything created under logos from my opinion but um yeah that doesn't take away from the idea that there could be an underworld connection with that as well Absolutely. That was a great question. Great insight there. Um, and Electric Thou is saying that the civilizations are still down there. And, and I agree. You know, talk about Agartha and Inner Earth. Um, another thing that is um, something to look at are volcanoes. And Jules Verne novel, The Journey to the Center of the Earth, um, the characters in the story enter from, I believe, from this. There's a volcano in Iceland, a stratovolcano, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. I don't, I don't remember what it is, but it's like one of those long Icelandic names. Um, they enter that, and then they find, you know, this this world inside, and then they exit by the Stromboli volcano, which is in in Italy. And so, um, I think they're interested as well, the volcano system. Very interesting. Yeah, I I wouldn't disagree with that because I think that volcanoes, the whole narrative and definition of them, from what uh, I addressed with with Philip and even Campbell doing uh, work on the spoil tips, because they can literally actually New Earth has done uh, videos on how the mining excess spoil tips can literally act like volcanoes because it all coalesces. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all connected. And it, it again, there is merit in doing the research. And uh, Heartline Realm, thank you very much for that super sticker. That's amazing. And that might be the first one that I've ever got. So you're on the board for that one. Thank you. Very, very cool. I didn't even know I kept that on. <laughs> one, one, other, one other thing to add about volcanoes is I think the ancients yeah. knew how to harness that energy. And that was part of their secrets of how they created all of this. Um, I found uh, volcanoes all over all along alignments. I found them in France. I found them yeah. in Australia. That reminds me um, of what I wanted to tail off of earlier. I'm sorry, Michelle. Um, no, no, it's fine. About uh, how, the, how they knew of the nodes. How did, how did, for example, the ancient Moorish or Tartarian or 
however you want to call it, that ancient benevolent civilization, high society or high advanced civilization, how they found these notes. And maybe they just, the way that we're experiencing synchronicities now, they just progressed way more along that path of uh, everyone was um, more ascended, if you will. I hate to say that we're all, but we're all fallen. It is what it is, in my opinion. They were more on, on a path of enlightenment and maybe they were able to feel the energies. You know? that's, that's the path we're supposed to be on. <laughs> Agree. That's a great way to put it, Michelle. And that's maybe the we path we were on. <laughs> they literally were able to feel it or maybe they were even actually able to see it because they're just most, so much more spiritually progressed. And that's some place where we can get to. And I keep on coming back to the fact that people will say, well, why research history if you can just deduce that it's all a lie? That's a glass half full um, outlook, in my opinion, or ladle half full. We like to have ladles overflowing of piping hot country gravy here. You know, Michelle, how we do it. So um, that's why there is merit. There is utility into coming together and doing stuff like we're doing now. And again, I, I thank you very much for taking the time out to give me, uh, give me an opportunity to interview you. Well, thank you. It's really been an honor and a pleasure. Yeah, um, obviously we'll we'll do it again, and um, like Campbell said, we also Paul Cook. If we can try to get everybody on the same table, we'd like to have more of these and provide this information for you guys, our our um, viewers and our fans, and everything. It's um it's humbling to me, and uh, we'd like to I could say network the realm, if you will. But you could do this stuff out your door, and you can share it with us. Don't ever be afraid to send an email or try to engage with us. We're very receptive and open to it. And this is how the research moves forward professionally, respectfully, with stuff like this. So again, I'm going to I'm gonna end this right now. Again, Michelle, unless you want to um, have anything to add. Uh, but again, again, thank you very much. And um, if you want to say anything, the final thoughts, please do. No, you did a great job on putting the question list together. You know, it's a huge amount of information to organize, so it really helped focus our conversation today. And I think I made made a much better interview than just, you know, hip shooting back and forth. So that was great. Thank and you. Um, I am working currently on the research for my next YouTube video, which is going to be on tracking back the what we know as the House of Windsor, the British royal family. Yep, we we're talking. Um, yep, yep. I it's it's going to be a big one. They love to record their own history, and when you do that, it's it's filled with gravy too. So, I I hope to have it done before I travel at the end of next week. I'm I'm going to try. I've got some things to do before I leave that will probably take time away, but I'm at least halfway done with it, and it will pretty much, you know, pull the lid off of who who did this, how they did it, um, but they came in through one family line in Germany and they managed to take over the Royal houses of Europe and reseed it. And, you know, that's who we know as the Royals today and not good. Well, I'll be looking forward to that. <laughs> so, so I'll be coming out with that. And uh, my website is piercing the veil of illusion.com. I have uh, my YouTube video channel is Michelle Gibson. And if you type in M O O R S after that, you'll, it'll pop right up. Uh, Moore's. And then I have Patreon uh, forward slash piercing the veil of illusion, doc, or piercing the veil of illusion. And I'm an educator and publisher on a new platform called Nguru. And I have a um, social media group and I do exclusive content for both Patreon and Nguru. And it's right now it's loading up with new um, educators. And so it's, it, you can't see the website and I'll send you the links, Dustin. Please do. Um, but it's, it's, it's new and it's designed to provide empowering information to people so they can think for themselves and um, give tools to navigate the, the world we live in today with all of its craziness. That's great. There's no other way to uh, end it on that, uh, providing tools for people that are interested in our work. That's how we do it. And, um, that's great. Go check out Michelle at her channel and uh, we will continue the research. Please continue to follow us and um, like, share, subscribe, all that. Okay. Take care and, and be safe, everybody. Keep your heads up and keep your spirits up. Uh, we certainly need it right now. Be there for your friends and your family. 
Okay. Take care. And uh, again, be safe. All right. Berserker Pair and Michelle out. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining in.